Welcome to Caveman Corner with your host, Jeff. Captain Caveman! Didn't do so good on the open today, Ray. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm you missed the whole Caveman Studios and all that stuff. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so tired today. You're fired. They took an hour. They took an hour for me. And you got a flat tire. Yep. And you got to really work on talking to the mic. This mic sucks, man. I know. <laughs> Give you the baby mic. All right, we got a we got a room full of people today. This is the most packed the Caveman Studios ever been. We got Dusty Rose. Hey. Hey, Dusty's in the studio. We got Brandon Muckle. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> And we got our co-host, Ray, like always. Hey, what's up, guys? Well, we're going to do some more of our black belt um, specials, interviewing all the local black belts. Uh, Brandon was just, just received his black belt. How does that feel, man, black belt? Um, it's an, it's, it's, it feels like a real ultimate source of power. And <laughs> I feel divine. <laughs> no, it pretty much feels the same. What can I say? It's just, I guess, a, just I, a different color. You go out, you have a good time, you celebrate it. At the end of the day, you're still the same instructor that you always were. It's just different color now. Different color? <laughs> that almost sounds racist. <laughs> yeah. Going from brown town to bigger and blacker things. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Once you go black, you don't go back. That's true. <laughs> Whoa, Mux. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to know what's going on downstairs. You know, I don't like to dwell down uh, too much myself. <laughs> this one's going to take a lot of editing, I can tell already. <laughs> so, your black belt ceremony was a little bit different than almost everyone I've ever been to. Not too often do you have people come in from other schools. What brought all that about and, and what happened? That was something that was really great to see. I brought all my kids up that were on the mat just to see the people from other gyms. Come and watch me get your black belt. You've been all over the area. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, Yeah, that's um, something that's really special to me. Um... Like, uh, you know, Professor Josh, Professor Larry showed up. And, like, you know, I, I trained at a, a lot of gyms in the area. Um, I spent most of my time at, you know, W&Y and Buff B2J, but I also was at the original Pursue. Um, so I, I spent a time at a lot of different gyms, and, you know, I think when those guys came out, like, you know, they recognized, like, um, how much I have, you know, dedicated my life to jiu-jitsu. And I think I think they respect that, and um, you know Josh and Larry, especially like just incredible guys, and just you know they'll give you the shirt off their back kind of people. So you know um, I always tried to leave every gym, even if I you know was kind of had to leave. I always try to leave on a good note, or at least try to be a positive person, and you know not talk bad about another gym. So. I always try to do something, you know, positive with my time there. And, you know, those guys are still really good friends to me. And so, you know, deep down, they're just, you're just, they're just my friends. So, you know, something, it was a special day. And, you know, I wasn't exactly sure that was going to happen that day. But uh, Coach Dub and all the guys made sure everybody came out, and I appreciate that. Okay, I want to hear the inside scoop, Dusty. Did, did he know or did he not know that we were all getting together to do that for him? He, I don't think he did know, although I was the meanest I've ever been to him that week because um, there was a few, few people who drank a little too much at our uh, Christmas party. One of them came up and like tried to congratulate him, and I then told him that he was never going to get his black belt because I didn't want it to ruin the surprise, and then one time he looked at my phone while his brother was texting, and I had to yell at him for looking at my phone, which I don't really care. So I don't think he knew because of how many I was 50-50 going to the day. There was, because, again, I won't name names, and not that I hold anything against him. I love, I love the guy. But he did say something at the Christmas party, which, you know, got my wheels turning. I'm like, hmm, that seems a little bit, like, why would you say that? <laughs> because I mentioned Dusty. She started, I think, creating a kind of psychological... <laughs> plan to kind of trick me into thinking it wasn't going to happen so even like <laughs> even like the person that told me that like is at my noon class and he's like oh you're gonna be an open mat tonight i'm like uh yeah and he's like yeah i'm not sure i'm gonna make it and it was just it was just kind of playing off it was good it was good acting but at deep down i'm like i'm on to you but i was i was like 50 50 going into the day 
And it was a huge storm that night, if nobody remembers. So Dubs was afraid we were not going to make it too. Yeah, I know. And then Kate was <laughs> blasting all everywhere. We're open today no matter what. And I was like, <laughs> man, I really wish you wouldn't have said that because I really didn't want to do the kids' comp team, to be honest <laughs> with you. I was really hoping that I could just jump back and skip the kids' comp team and do open mat so I could hang out and see the whole thing. I was scared I was going to miss it, to be honest with you. It was a big thing for me, too. I mean, we trained for a long time. I think you were, we were white belts when we uh, we were both white when we started training, right? Or was I already a blue? Yeah. I think I went to Buff BJJ in 2011. I think you probably were a blue belt. Yeah. So for everyone that doesn't know, Brandon went from white to black before I even made it to brown, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. He was training really hard. Yeah. And you you were in the cage. Yeah. That's something else you've done for a long time. You were a cage fighter. You even fought Ali Rex Happy, who I think is probably the best athlete that I've ever seen in the cage at all. It's funny. I was... I saw him drilling with uh, Anthony Rubin yesterday. They were doing a single leg defense to like the Kimura roll. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I just mentioned like, yeah, you know, pin that hand to the chest because I saw him repping in the cage. <laughs> like I go to Rubin, like, especially if you're Ali, because if you don't do that, he's just like, he reminds me of, uh, remember Mike Tyson's punch out? <laughs> yeah. Remember that like the Indian guy that just kind of uh -huh. like disappears and right. then he's in front of you, uppercutting you? Yes. That's like him. Like that's his hips. His hips are just unbelievable. Like his spine is a slinky. And if your body's not in perfect position, he'll be on your back or he'll be like standing up on you. There's positions I've had him in where I've had everything perfect and he just slinkies out. Yeah. There's no one like Ali anywhere. He's more athletic than Pat. And yeah. Pat was the most athletic guy I've ever rolled up with up until that point. Yeah. And like fighting him, like... Had I known what, like, I heard, like, rumors about him, but had I known, like, I think I, think I passed his guard in the fight. Like, had I known that, I wouldn't have tried nothing. I would have just stayed there and stalled. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't have done a damn thing. I wouldn't have thrown a punch. I would have just been, like, try to be fat. And he probably still would have got out. But, like, yeah, that dude's unbelievable. That's one of the really tough things for me, since I'm friends with everyone from every academy, is when you guys fight each other, I know, like, I know how good Ali was. And I... Try to give you a little hint in the write-up leading up to it. Yeah. That was the best I could do. I couldn't come out and tell you. I mean, we're teammates and stuff. But I, I consider us good friends, you know. <laughs> and I was, like, excited to see that fight. I still think that's probably one of the best fights that TNT ever had. Yeah, I agree. That's the best fight. Yeah, I thought it was a great fight. That was a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Going in that fight, like, you know, because I was, like, I was debating. I was even, like, that's going to be my last time in my fight or I'm going to make it a thing. And I wasn't sure um how i was gonna go with it because i was thinking about going to tristar in montreal because and i was like, kind of like doing really well in mma but at the same time you always got that jujitsu thing in mind it's like i could always feel it if i took away time from my jujitsu i felt it like and i think when i got the wmy i was like rolling with like guys like you know antonio and that crew and like i saw like what they were you know bringing the level at so at that point, I'm like, well, I've, I think I'm going to be part of the jiu-jitsu, and I want to be a part of that because that was, like, the first time I really saw, like, the level and potential of, like, Buffalo jiu-jitsu. And, like, all it required was just, like, people that were, like, really dedicated. And once, like, once I saw that, like, on a competitive level, then I'm like, okay, I'll be a part of this, and I'll let go of the MMA. What do you think is harder to compete in, MMA or jiu-jitsu at that high level? Not, I mean, at local tournament level, but at, like, Pan's World's level. Oh, at the highest level, you know, it's jujitsu. It goes in such a micro. It, it goes in such the micro. Like everything in jujitsu at that level has to be perfect. I feel like MMA, you can be really good at some stuff, but like, you know, for example, you don't need great jujitsu in MMA to be a great MMA guy. You can have great posture from the guard and beat the crap out of a really good jujitsu guy. Which is, you know, it's jujitsu in the south, but you don't, I don't need to know a bunch of leg drag variations and counters and, you know, re pumbles and stuff. So in MMA, you know, you can get away with, you know, not having to advance certain positions. You can get away with posturing and beating somebody up. So I think jujitsu, it's, it's, just, it's just a specialty, you know? You're not an overall great fighter in jujitsu, you're just a great jujitsu athlete, you're a great jujitsu mind. Where MMA, you got to be, you know, relatively good at a lot of things. But jujitsu is like that ultra focus where you go to super deep waters. And then, to me, that's like, it's always such a cliche, but I really feel like jujitsu is more like chess than MMA. Chess, 
I'm amazed, like chess, but chess is chess where you can drop a bomb on somebody <laughs> on the chessboard and blow it up, you know? Well, let's hope it's not too much like chess because Ray's fighting soon. And uh, I've seen Ray play chess, so I don't <laughs> I want to see Ray win a fight. <laughs> oh, damn. Why you got to throw me under the bus? <laughs> Dude, you've been throwing Alex Carroll's girls under the bus, so I got to oh, okay. strike back for him a little bit. All right. He's helpless, so I gotta, I gotta do a little poking back for him. Yeah. So the fight. Yeah, she got more balls than him. You bunk it up, okay, man. And I did. Watching you fight is amazing because, as dedicated as you are to jiu-jitsu, when I watch you start to turn to MMA, I watch the, the boxing come along. I watch you put all those rounds of victory. You really lived and breathed MMA. I just. Oh, I love it. I know. I I, I can't it. see that. You haven't fought in a long time, man. I'm just trying to get you back in there. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, I, I love it. My thing is, and that's the thing that, like, separates, like, someone like me and Pat Mix, is, like, Pat Mix is so focused all the time. I come in waves with, like, my, my competition mind. Like, sometimes I'm really into competition, but once I'm done with the competition, like, it takes a while for me to build back, like, that fire. Like, it just, like, it, it just, like, goes away. Going back to what you said about, like, victory. Victory was, like... Victory is what made me, like, it forced me to be tough. And, like, I tell the story about the one time, like, one of the first times I'm in the cages at Victory. And, like, the month when I started from the month later was a complete 180 for me. The first month, I remember, like, I'm in the cage and Herbert's doing the rounds. And I think I was with, like, um, maybe Frankie or Mazio. But I remember I got kneed in the solar plex. I went down, had my hand on the ground. Herbert stopped. He's like, all right, take a minute. Wait a little bit. It's like, all right, you ready? I'm like, yeah. All right. We clinch back up. Happens again. <laughs> I go back down. He's like, get up. I'm like, <laughs> I look at him I'm like, all right. <laughs> it's real now. I know what he's doing. I know why he's doing it. This ain't jujitsu trying to protect me. He's trying to make me tough. And at that point, like, I realized, like, yeah, we strike now. We hit. Like, the first time I, one of the first times I'm uh, sparring with you, you beat the shit on my legs <laughs> repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. And then you beat them up and then you mounted me when I had no guard because my legs were bruised <laughs> and useless. And then you held my neck down. There's that classic picture you holding me down at Buffalo BDJ <laughs> with your hand on my throat. With you <laughs> mounted over my arms. I couldn't even tap out and you just punch in my face. <laughs> and you're just loving it. <laughs> Man, just <laughs> sadistic and tough and real <laughs> but like once i like a month i remember like a month later i'm like i'm in the cage and i'm starting to find like you know how i can blend my jujitsu together and you know set up my strikes or and my takedowns my strikes and it wasn't always perfect but like i, I like once i started realizing i can blend my style with mma I'm like i really started to enjoy it and i love the boxing there man i love working with tommy and paulie who were there you you came along so much in boxing. I remember the first time we boxed, I was like, Jesus Christ, I don't think this kid should fight. <laughs> and by then, we were like training blows. We were playing rock'em, sock'em robots, man. It was fun. Yeah. I like it. Uh, you always beat me up. You and Keith always, you guys always had to like that range. And But I was, I like I, even like when Alex C from the gym was like kind of starting out back then, I, I love boxing with him. It was always a lot of fun. And you always had Paulie in your ear. Like, I love Paulie because he was like our <laughs> Mickey. He like he never got my name right either. <laughs> He'd always work with me. He liked me, and like I'd be at the bag, and like he would come off to me and like you know in my ear and sh like he, he just like had that voice that cut right through. He's like, Shannon, I want you to go up to the bag. I want you to hit it really fucking hard. <laughs> I'm like it's branded. That's right, Shannon. Fucking hit the bag. Fucking one two. <laughs> just needed a better nickname. <laughs> Kate man's easy to remember. No one gets it wrong ever. <laughs> I bet you half the people that listen to this don't even know my real name. No, they don't. No. <laughs> no. Ray, do you know my name? <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> Charlie Dent. Can you can you hear your right ear down? Sure. I've never seen anybody with that ear that just like <laughs> like I got this. Like I think I think God and actually gave me this when I was a white belt. Yeah. I remember him like folding my ear. Like at uh <laughs> Did you say pulling your ear? No, it was like I think he had like I think I was trying to skip side control, I folded over my ear, like trying to roll out of it. I got this, but I never blew back up. But like your ear was just always like, <laughs> yeah, it's a little mangled. Can you hear of it? Sure, I can even get earbud in if I like push it really hard. Really, it just doesn't come out. It's hard getting it out. It's badass. Yeah, <laughs> this one was worse. I had this one folded all the way over. This one I had to get drained because I wore glasses at the time. And it was like folded <laughs> over like this, and I had to get it drained. It took thirty six cc's out of my ear 
To anyone that knows how much a CC is, that's a lot of fluid. Yeah. They used the big needle that they use on your knees on my ear. It was pretty gross. I kind of wish I would have kept that one. If I knew I was getting LASIK, I would have. That would be pretty badass. <laughs> I would fold the ear like this. Yeah. Karis doesn't. She's shaking her head no, but she would love it. One is enough. <laughs> Someday I'll have that again. So let's talk about competition a little bit. You competed in jiu-jitsu a whole lot. When you came over to WNY, you brought pretty much the whole competition team from Buffalo Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. How did that happen? Well, they didn't really stick around much. I mean, I'm not getting into details, but, you know, um, I was working at Buff BJJ, and eventually got to the point where it just, the atmosphere just wasn't working out for me. And, uh, you know, I give all, you know, Professor Chuck was an incredible instructor, I, and I still think he's one of the finest instructors, his knack for jiu-jitsu, and his lineage training director from Carlson is, he, he just, he just really understood jujitsu and, and above anything else, he taught me how to teach jujitsu. I think not to cut you short a little bit, but I think he's one of the best teachers I've ever had jujitsu. When Henzo came, Henzo was a little bit better teacher, but he's the only person I can think of uh, that was even close to Chuck. Yeah. Chuck just breaks it down so well. Yeah. And I always respected his way of, he didn't care whether you were training a technique for one week or six weeks, it didn't matter. As, but the thing was, he's going to drill it into you whether you liked it or not. And I always respect that. Like, because I feel like a lot of jujitsu instructors will just teach something one day and then go on something else the next day, and they're really scatterbrained. But that's not how you learn anything. You don't. You know, you can't. You can't spend one. If you're learning chemistry, you can't spend one day on one topic and go bounce around to another topic and come back to it six weeks later and expect people to know it. No, you got to really hammer in the people so he did that and i think that's one of his finest attributes and just understanding like you know the body mechanics of things and breaking down techniques and you know it's it's a credit of being part of a great lineage directly from carlson up to in de La Hiva. but going back to your original question yeah like you know i was working there unfortunately like um the atmosphere just like you know it just wasn't working out for me and i know chuck you know, he demands things his way, and I respected that, and I wasn't going to try to change anything, so, you know, I decided to leave. When I left, you know, some people felt the same way, and we came, we came over. You know, I don't, I don't think I, I brought some of the competitors. I think John Reynolds came with me, but, you know, he didn't stick around much because, you know, they, they went back to uh, Buma because, obviously, there's a bunch of both BBJ people, so I felt like more like their team, and also WMY kind of, like, you know, it was kind of, like, a little hostile at the time. <laughs> but... Yeah, we came over, but, you know, I kind of knew everybody, so I felt like I was in a better position because, you know, I knew a lot of those people because I spent so much time training MMA, so I knew a bunch of, a bunch of people in the Victory Merger, and I trained with a bunch of people that I, I worked with at the uh, at Buffalo Training Center, and I knew you. Yeah, you know, WM Lab is just like a hodgepodge of, like, collective gyms that came together, so I've been the scene a long time, so for me, the transition was a bit easier. I feel like a lot of those guys, they were kind of like, you know, they came in and, you know, WNY is such a big place. It's kind of like, I imagine like moving to a new high school and just like, <laughs> you know, going to cafeterias, like where the hell do I sit? For a while, I think we had the best competition team around. We had all the guys that you brought. We had you, we had Antonio, we had Catillus, we oh, had yeah. Jow, we had Dude. Jordan Speed, Marlin. I mean, the whole team was just a bunch yeah. of killers. And that's the thing, that, that like broke my heart like when that happened because like, I think best team easily you know i think you got toronto bjj i think you got a few schools in new york city i don't think anybody would have touched us in like a 400 500 mile radius had we all stuck together i i really believe that because it's just man you just for a good jujitsu team you just need people dedicated and it takes a certain person because there's no money at jujitsu it it takes people with a fire in their belly everybody else is just like a hobbyist mostly but like if you want to be a competitor in jujitsu that means you really want it for reasons outside of monetary gain. You want to solve the puzzle. Like, it's eating away at you. And, I, you know, I saw that. And, like, we had so many good guys who are training every day. And we had people that were making sure people were coming early and coming to the open mats. And people breaking down the techniques. Those are the positives. There was also some cons of certain things. But, like, had the team stuck together and they're, we were able to make it work. Like, oh, my God, dude. W and Y still has some really great guys. Lima has great guys. Boomer has great guys. You know, I feel like every gym has some really great guys. But like my thing has always been like, if Buffalo really wants to produce adult level world champions, 
at purple, brown, and black, then the city needs to work together because the city's really not big enough. It's not like LA. It's not like New York. It's not like Miami. The city needs to work together to create like, you know, collective open mats and have like pro level competition trainings and really work to pass down the knowledge that people gain to the teenagers and the kids so they know how to go through the circuit and you know how to play the game and how to learn techniques and how to build your system so like to me it's just like it's you know as as much as i love the local tournaments to me the local tournaments never really mattered it's i always thought bigger than that like i want to see how we did in new york city i want to see how we did at pants and worlds and cause that's all that really like really matters if you're king of buffalo so what if you're the king of pittsburgh whatever new york great but like at the end of the day, like reach, you know, reach for the stars. Why well, try to be the best in one city? And I feel like you know it takes a it takes a city effort. In New York, the, you know, they got like Unity Open Mat. All this, all the teams come together. They train in LA. All the teams come together. They train because it's it's understood. We all train together. Let the cream rise to the top. But I th- I think Buffalo being you know unfortunately there's a lot of still politics that stems way back. That it's kind of tough to do it. And I, re- I really wish that situation wasn't like that. I really think there needs to be like a neutral ground where that can happen. And, you know, even if it's like once a month, bring everybody together, let the, let the scene grow, let the skill grow. Then let's see how we do at these like major tournaments. What do you think makes this split happen all the time? Because it seems like this gym split and they split and they split. Uh, the same core of competitors kind of stays together, like Antonio and them guys. They left, you know, they all went to us, and then they all went to Lima. They're all kind of staying together, trying to get the best training that they can. Yeah. But I think it kind of ends up hurting everybody because they get together and they only train, and now they're eliminating us from them and them from us, you know what I mean? We're not able to all train together. Why do you think that that happens over and over again here in Buffalo? seems like it's like a revolving door where the competitors go. I just think it's – it depends on what your ultimate – priority is people value different things so if you really value competition you know you're going to find the people that value the same thing and you're going to stick together some people value loyalty some people value lineage and i feel like that's something like buffalo bg is like it's very lineage and very loyal and it's like you don't move to other gyms something like wny i feel it's a little more family oriented and you know it's a camaraderie especially now it's really building and you know it's it's, it's a blend we got a ton of competitors and you know, it, it's it's a blend, and we get together and we grind. Um, but, you know, I think people just have different priorities. And sometimes if you got a little bit of one priority with a bit, little bit of another, it's going to make you stay at one place. But if you're too much in the other way, you'll go to another place, which is fine. In regards to me, like, you know, I just moved from Buffalo B to JWY, so I wasn't really looking to move to another gym. Even though, like, you know, I knew I was going to, like, miss a lot of those, like, guys, you know, giving you, like, tough roles. Because that's also important to me is, you know, my belief in that to get really good jiu-jitsu and get the benefits out of jiu-jitsu, you need to grind. You need to break yourself down and rebuild yourself up. And you got to go through, like, that plateau. But at WNY, you know, I, I felt like a sense that, like, Dub, like, took care of me and he gave me a job. And there was a lot of guys I liked there and I lost a lot of potential. And when those guys left, so, you know, I just said, uh, you know, I'll miss them. I hope I get to train with them again. But, you know, I'm, I'm not looking to move gyms again. This is my home now. If you were going to go to one gym to compete and be a competition black belt, where would you go? Uh, Marcel Garcia's, New York. Uh, how about in the area? Oh. Um, That's a good answer, though. That's a better answer than what I was looking for. Right. <laughs> I'd, just, I'd stay with our gym, man. Yeah? Yeah. We got, yeah. We, got, we, got, we, got, we got so many good guys. Matt Flores, I think he's got one of the best half guards in the city. Pat Mix is freaking believable pat mix i think can beat anybody around in the I th- area i man. think honestly i think if pat mix trained jiu-jitsu for six months and just jiu-jitsu he can go out the pans and worlds and medal easily i think so, without too. doubt without a doubt he's unbelievable he's especially amazing. at blue can you imagine oh my god when he was fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god you have to promote him you can't yeah. <laughs> win a world at blue oh my god yeah. do you yeah. see that the dude from uh, bellator He's a three-time NCAA champion. Uh, he did pans at Blue Belt. And he was oh, yeah, just yeah. smashing everybody. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if the IBJJF. Sometimes I wonder about these like, kind of things. Like, the IBJJF has a rule, like Johnny Z Pow, who was training at Buffalo BJ. He technically wasn't allowed to compete because I think he competed a little bit in college as a white belt. Right. 
but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't a blue belt, so he couldn't compete at blue belt. So he wasn't allowed to compete at all, like technically. But you know, he still signed up for white belt and killed it. Right. Yeah. Sometimes with grappling tournaments, it gets kind of weird like that. It's just how do you, how do you separate like some of these guys with all that grappling experience? What do you think about the IBJJF in general? Overall, I, I like it. I, I get kind. Of, I, get, I think they might be kind of oversaturating things. I think there might be a little too many tournaments now. I don't like the way they seem to be increasing their prices a lot. <laughs> I do think they do a lot of money grabs, but they do put on a lot of tournaments, and without a doubt, the IBJJF is, if you're a serious gi jiu-jitsu competitor, that's where you need it competing, without a doubt. No gi is a little bit different now. It's very different now. And then I would say, like, for, like, black belts, I, I, got, I got certain aspects of the rules I would change, you know, whether black belts, or I think, I think like, purple belts should be all, like, the knee bar and toe hold, too. I think in IBJJF black belt level no gi, they should be able to heel hook if they want to stay competitive with like, you know, EBI, and and ADCC and, yeah, and all that stuff. Sure. And I think the IBJJF should be offering way more money for athletes. You know, I don't have their books. I don't know what they make. I don't know how many people they pay. So I don't have their books. So I don't know exactly how it works out, but. They got to be making a ton because they're making all the money and all the black belts and stuff too. They have to go oh, through yeah. all the filings and. Yeah. What do you think about that? That they're kind of running ranking of, of jujitsu everywhere. Okay. Do you like that? That they have, there's like one organization that, if you want to be a black belt and be ranked and be able to rank people, you pretty much have to go through the IBJJF. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I, you know, I don't really support a monopoly in any kind of regard. I think it's good because it is a form of police that prevents a bunch of fakes from getting through. It, it keeps in mind the lineage and respects the lineage. And in my mind, uh, jiu-jitsu lineage, it's really, really important because you know the gyms that exist that don't have an actual lineage. They just have a grappling instructor. And those right. guys, 9.9 out of times, suck. <laughs> you know, they got terrible jiu-jitsu. They don't understand it. They look at jiu-jitsu as just a bunch of different techniques that don't kind of blend together. It's just like, oh, I got an iron bar. I got a, you know, I got a mount escape. But, like, you know, it's, it's not a deep level jiu-jitsu because they're not trained with deep-minded jiu-jitsu people. They don't get to understand the intricacies of it. So I, th- I think the IBJJF, I mean, I like that. I, I actually do support that. Like that you, if you're going to compete in an IBJJF tournament, you got to be a credit from my IBJJF instructor. Or you got to like have the lineage to prove it. Because if not, then it just kind of like, I, I don't know. Like I just feel like it'll decay and kind of disintegrate a little bit. Every other tournament, you don't need to have that. Like you can go register, but the proof is in the pudding. Why do the best guys compete in the IBJJF tournaments? Why do you see guys from Atos and, you know, Alliance and, you know, GFT and all these teams? Why are they producing the best guys? Why are these guys going out the world and killing it every year? Well, it's in the lineage. The lineage breeds great competitors, and in turn, it attracts other competitors. So when you get these IBJJF tournaments happening and, you know, it's the world championships, and you look at the... Who's winning these tournaments? Well, it's usually a lot of the same teams every year. And every now and then, a team splinters and a new team is formed. And over time, they can become dominant. It's never just some renegade hodgepodge school in the middle of nowhere. No, it's, it's jiu-jitsu is an oral tradition. It's a physical tradition. And it needs to be taught in person. It's not something you learn on YouTube. It can't be taught. you gotta, you got to feel it. You got to drill it. You got to spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours doing it. In that regard, I respect IBJJF for doing that and keeping that strict. I mean, I don't like the fact that I have to pay $400 for a, <laughs> a black belt registration now to the IBJJF so I can get striped a couple years from now. But yeah, what can you do? Yeah, that's, you know, it's, that's it, some it, of the it's, stuff. It's the I've... best thing you have for a diploma in jujitsu that means something. I, I like aspects of it, and I don't like other aspects of it. You know, just like I, I think you should get points for turnover. I don't think they should rate black belts to uh, be able to get tips. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I like it. I just wish it was just a little bit more regulated somehow. Yeah. What you said about Monopoly feels like 100% correct. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, they definitely have, don't have the Nogi Monopoly anymore. Not that they really did. But, yeah, yeah like something like the rules, too. Like, I don't understand, like, I don't disagree. Like I don't. I don't think a reversal should necessarily count. Maybe like an advantage or something. But someone put it to me like you shouldn't get rewarded for being in a bad position because you got your guard passed, which I don't disagree. But like I never understand why crucifix doesn't get points. That was always my pet peeve because I always love looking for crucifix. <laughs> it's like, dude, you got like you got the guy like spread out, no arms. You took away both his arms. Right. You get points for neon belly, but you don't get points for crucifix. Like I never understood that. 
and there's a lot of ways to game the system in IBJJF, like, you know, putting your toe back in half guard so you can repass and repass and repass and rack up points, like stuff like that. I could probably go on and on about this. That's what we got you here for, to go on and on, <laughs> on, and on about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the worst thing about being a player in Buffalo, man. It's so expensive to compete because you got to always travel. If you're in L.A., there's so many tournaments by you. You don't have to. You just got to pay registration fees and find a way. You just need a car. Right. Like in Buffalo. Like, honestly, that's like, for me, like, five years competing, like, jujitsu, like, every day or, like, every week. Not every week. It becomes exhausting, like, financially. It does. Very exhausting. I think that's kind of why all the competitors stick together, too, so they can carpool, they can get to every, everywhere together. Yeah. Like, if you got guys that are going to pans, you got to be training with these guys because not only do you need them to train with, you financially need them to be able to get to these tournaments. So these guys almost are forced to stick together whether they want to or not. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they're, they're your team. They're teammates, man. Like I was going to say, if I was going to compete, uh, an IBJJF and I wanted to do Pans or World, I would probably go train at Lima, to be honest with you, because those are the guys that are going there. You kind of need that support, you know? Training with everybody. Yeah. I mean... I think we should have open mats everywhere. And that would, like, fix a lot of the problems. I agree. You should be training with... Like, if you're training with a tournament, you should be training with as many people as possible. You should find out the top guys, but you should be seeking out people with different kind of games. And every school has something to offer, man. Right. Every single school has somebody in that school that has really good jujitsu and has something to offer again like you look at like some place like lima antonio's got like one of the best single leg x guards and like one of the best guards like he's just got a really great competitive mind like when he is in passing mode like he's super conservative he doesn't let you get grips but when it's time to go and pass he's going to go at it his mindset is the reason why he won he took silver pants this weekend right and you know if I wanted to go train at Buma, like you got someone like Larry Backless, who's got a phenomenal half guard. Best half guard in the area. Oh my God. I think, one of the best sure. one of the best mounts. Like his mount's unbelievable. Or Josh is an incredibly like conceptual mind and always he's always got something on his brain he's thinking about. He's another great teacher. I mean, you're a great teacher too. I'm just going around you because yeah. obviously I have Brandon sitting here. Brandon is an awesome teacher. I've taken classes from Brandon and he breaks everything down very well. Especially exactly where your feet are supposed to be, where your hands are supposed to be on the passes. Ray can attest to this, right? How are privates with Brandon? Oh, that was great, man. I picked him because I know he, he did MMA and uh, he knows what he's talking about. And he, uh, I have fun with him and I hopefully I could do some more with him. Thank now you. that he's a black belt, they're only $196 an hour. Oh, God. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but wait a minute, I work in three jobs now. Good. $296 an hour. <laughs> Yeah, don't tell me Brandon, that. you should let me be your hype guy. I'm going to get right? you all kinds of business. What was I saying, though? But yeah, like, um, yeah, everybody, every school has got something amazing to offer in this area. I, I always feel like, you know, if we just find a way to combine it and put a lot of the differences aside and find a neutral spot to train, we're all going to get way, way, way better. And to me, that's the one thing that always mattered to me was just making Buffalo the best jujitsu spot we can possibly make it. We can make it this amazing concentrated area where just like the knowledge is spreading and the competitors are going out there and winning big tournaments and we're just grinding and you know it could be something but you know we can keep it separate we can have our local tournament every year and beat the crap out of each other and have a beer after and you know see who's the best in the area that's fine i always feel like the people that work at the hardest will end up at the top and, you know, people have different priorities in life, but the people that really want to be the best jiu-jitsu will rise, and I truly believe that. I really feel like if we're going to really maximize our potential, we need to put away a, a lot of the politics and find a way to make it work. If not, you know, every school will continue to improve. No one's going downhill, but um, we're not really maximizing our potential. It depends. We, it we de need to get a world champion out of Buffalo. That's our goal. Somebody has to do it. And the adult level? Adult level. Yeah. I mean, well, we had we had Jordan Schultz. Not that he didn't really accomplish it in Buffalo, but... Yeah, he was already out. I don't count him. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he did it, but it's he tough. was in Atlanta, you know? It's, like, that's, it's different. It's tough, man. It's... it's I, I broke into the top eight at Worlds at Purple, man, and it was just like a brick wall. Mm -hmm. Like a fighting Gonzaga. Like, I'll never forget that moment. It was just like... Someone my size with that like amount of technique and pressure and just like this is by far like a it's just like, you know, like it's that feeling like when you you're being outclassed not by physical attributes, but just because you know this guy has been training twice as long as you in a room full of killers 
since he's been five years old. And that's what it takes. You're not gonna you're not gonna produce any adult world champions in Buffalo. You need without like um a teenager program that's very competitive based, without an adult program that's inc- incredibly inc- uh technical and competitive and with the right kind of coaches and the right people and the different kind of games to blend together to get a person used to every situation in jiu-jitsu. Because there's so many, especially in gi jiu-jitsu, there's so many different kind of guards you can play and so many different looks you get. You got to be able to analyze one and break them down and understand how to enforce your game over that. So I don't, I don't, I don't think you can be a world champion in a gym that only has like 40, 50 people or even 300 people if the right people aren't there. It's got to be a collective thing where everybody's coming together and having a similar goal, even if it's just like once or twice a month. I think all the different schools have the different um, games they play, too. We all have different emphasis. Whoever our teachers are, we pick up those emphasis. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Everyone that trains with you is going to train a little bit like you, no matter what their game should be like. Yeah. You know, you just pick up what your teachers teach you. And when you see it all over, you can pick it up. Just You can pick it up from a blue belt, you know, a blue belt that plays a little bit a different game from you. You can learn that game just by, like, passing their game. But, like, wow, that would really work if, you know, because I have a sweep off of there, you know. Yeah. I think that a lot when I uh, – I do a lot of training over at Puma and training with Antonio over there. Like, everybody, you know. Yeah. Uh, Sundays we go over there and we beat the crap out of each other sometimes. Even Gray came over for a little bit, but he bitched out, Gray. Even <laughs> though he got great hair, you got to come back and get some training in. <laughs> He's too pretty for it. He's too pretty for it. But it's great training over there. and Yeah. I go, I go to Puma, like, once a month. Yeah. My brother's over there, mm-hmm. you know. I love those guys. Speaking of your brother, them. how did you guys get into jiu-jitsu? Um, I think Jay was telling the story on Friday. We were actually hanging out with him. Uh, yeah, I heard you guys were downstairs, and instead of looking at porno mags, you were uh, reading Natty Bravo books. No, and... It was probably porn, too. Um... <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm I'm more happy to know you now. <laughs> uh, well, my, my, brother was, uh, my brother was a wrestler at West Central West, and he, you know, he went through Modified, and... Uh, he was actually part of the best team West Uncle West ever had. West Uncle West was never really a powerhouse in Section 6. It's usually like Lancaster and Clarence and some of those teams. And so, like, his class, like, were really into it, and they produced a lot of great wrestlers. Yeah, he went through it, and uh, they won Section 6. They won sectionals, and, and then he went to college, and I think he found, like, a jiu-jitsu grappling club at Fredonia. And so he was always, like... Coming home from Fredonia, always wanted to try stuff on me, and you know, I did one year. I did one year of JV in high school and of wrestling, and I I liked it, but I was just doing because all my friends did it, and uh, I wasn't very good. And then I got a horrible skin rash, and I had to stop <laughs> after going like two and eight. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Then I got the worm and and Pentigo all together. Uh, there was, was no awful. YouTube back then. I didn't know what the fucking I didn't know the fuck I was doing. <laughs> but uh. You know, I was a musician. <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know what I was doing. But, uh, yeah, Jay would come home and, like, always want to do, like, these techniques on me. And, like, uh, he had a couple of books in the basement. Like, one summer he was, like, staying at home. And, like, he had, like, an Eddie Bravo book. And, like, I remember just, like, hanging on the basement and doing what we do and just, like, starting to read the book. Yeah, I, I like, I, I started reading this Eddie Bravo book and, like, you know, being the young, you know, college-age kid I was, you know, smoking non-tobacco products. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I like I, I like Eddie Brown put it in a way. It was like he he put all his games into a system. So he had his rubber guard game, and he had his half guard game, and he had his you know his top game. And like he he described like like each kind of game is your own video game. And like when you want to play this, you do that. When you want to do this, you want to do that. And each one has each system has its own path that you got to follow. And it's all a bunch of flow charts. And I don't know, just being like kind of like the nerd I am deep down, like it just kind of like made sense. I'm like, it's pretty cool. So like Jay was started doing stuff on me. I'm like, I started asking questions. And he was actually, uh, he went from Chuck's to Primo at Horizon for a little bit. I started going there. You know, Jay at the time thought Chuck didn't like him. Uh, I don't know if Jay owned money or something. He probably did. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy for Chuck not to like you on top of that. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, <laughs> Especially we, if you train with Primo. Yeah. Because he didn't like Primo too much either. <laughs> he just yeah. posted a thing about Primo the other day. He's like, before Primo I was in Buffalo, started. you just had fucking Primo Luciano or whatever. It's so funny. <laughs> I was like, dude, that was like 13 years ago. Let it go. <laughs> uh, Chuck is a good shit talker. Primo's a 
purple belt now, I think. I haven't heard nothing from Chuck you know, on Facebook. He's in Facebook jail. Poor guy. Oh. <laughs> it makes our world less good when Chuck is in Facebook jail. I think Primo had class like uh, like once or twice a week on Wednesday, and he did like this like it was like a you call that MMA class, but you know it's like you hit like the uh, the cardio fit class, like punching machine. Yeah, <laughs> and you like I don't know, he'd have you do like armbar from mount for you know twelve weeks in a row, and you know like it got me into jujitsu, and I give him credit for that. But then the one day I decided to go to like I was really getting into him, like I want to train more than twice a week, so. I saw uh, BTC had a, you know, free class or whatever. So, you know, I decided to check it out, and I drove over to Clarence Center. And I think that's, like, you know, a bunch of guys were there that, like, are now in the scene. Like, I think Chris Robinson was there and, you know, Craig Olmstrom and just, like, a bunch of those guys. Probably Roscoe was probably there. And, you know, that was the first time I got exposed to jujitsu on a bigger scale because there's more people to roll with, and it was just, like, Okay, because before it was just me and my brother and maybe, like, one other guy. A new guy, too, usually at yeah. Primo's place because they're always coming in new. Yeah. I trained there for a long time, too, before I went uh, to Chuck's. Yeah, then they bounce. Yeah. So after that, it was kind of like no question. It was like, okay, I got to be here. And they kind of just, like, you know, brought me down the rabbit hole. So who's better now, you or your brother? Oh, me. <laughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen since you had a whole, like, four years head start at least? Because Jay decided to pursue an actual career. <laughs> oh, jeez. Can you tell for the whole world that's listening, like all six of them? Uh, <laughs> the region. The, the region. Yeah, the, the region. What you sacrificed to get a black belt. I mean, what you've given up in your life. I saw this on Facebook the other day when you posted it, so I wanted to ask you. Well, I mean, there's, there's a few different kind of black belts. And, you know, anybody can be a black belt. If you spend enough time in jiu-jitsu... You're probably gonna get a black belt as long as you don't completely suck and you're not a you know a douchebag. You can probably get a black belt. You're out, um, right? But uh, you know, I didn't want I don't want to be any kind of black belt. I want to be like Marcel Garcia. I want to be a half of Mendez. I want to be Damian Maya. I want to be one of those guys. So you know, I kind of tap into their mindset and what's their mindset? Well, you make it your life. You train two, three times a day. I don't know why exactly. Like, because I didn't really have the aspirations of being a world champion when I first started. And even when I was going through, like, Buff BDJ and the Purple Bowl, I didn't think I was going to win worlds or anything. Like, I was sure damn going to try. But, like, you know, realistically, like, you know, like, those guys have been training twice as long as you since they were kids. And their dads are black belts and this and that. And, like, they're training in a little room in Rio de Janeiro trying to get out of poverty. <laughs> <laughs> like, you understand, like, what's ahead of you. But, like... I just, I just love the process of going in every day and just every day you leave a little bit better and you rep your stuff and you make it your own. Uh, Rob Jameson, I, I forget, I don't know if he quoted it, but he's just like, every time you learn a technique, you make payments on it, you drill it, you learn it, you rep it in practice, you try to do it in a sparring, and every time you do it, you make another payment on it until it finally yours. So like, you know, when I was studying like Marcelo, I'd get all his DVDs and I'd look at his books and try to break it down and I'd be at work reading, I'd be in school reading it. I can't tell you how much time, I probably spent more time off the mat studying jujitsu than I did on the mat. If you're gonna be like an elite world champion or elite black belt, that's your job. You should be looking at jujitsu at least eight hours a day. Now you can be a good black belt and train like, you know, four or five times a week. That's possible, but I really feel like jujitsu is something that you really need to feel. You need to, understand the dance of jiu-jitsu and when someone's on top of you forcing their body in another way you got to be able to sense where the energy is going and be able to redirect that energy and that's something you just can't learn in a video that's something you can't learn anything else but hours and hours and hours of mat time so what i sacrificed was i started when i was like in early college so what i did sacrifice was a lot of my college time <laughs> so outside of my major i probably didn't do that well in, in class because if I was in a library and I didn't have anything to do outside my major, I was probably on YouTube or MG in Action or something like that, watching video. And then after college, you know, you find yourself in debt, but I didn't really care. So you kind of start sacrificing career. Like, well, I'm not going to go and get my master's because, you know, that's not going to help my jiu-jitsu. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go full-time with Jeremy Mills. 
because that ain't going to help my jujitsu working 60 hours a week in a grain elevator, which, you know, be a nice job to have, but good benefits. But it wasn't what I was really interested in. And these are things I could do. I could do. Like, I could be making 50 grand right now in a grain elevator, but it's not, it's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a top-level jiu-jitsu competitor. So you find ways to do it. So, you know, Josh Catchery got me a job at Pearl Street, allowed me to, like, you know, come and go as I please and take off of work and, you know, start me off as a busser and you become a bareback and server and all that stuff. Being in the service industry is to be a but like being trying to be an actor in Hollywood, like it allows you to do what you need to do. And it's not necessarily glamorous, but it gives you time to work and you, you sacrifice a ton. And, you know, then it's like 10 years later and it's just like you look around and it's like, OK, I might not be rich, but, you know, I got a teaching gig and I got a couple of jobs that allow me to pay my bills and jujitsu pays my rent and my bill, a couple of my bills and. You know, it's 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 nice. It does. It's not going to buy you a you know two story house and a pool in the backyard and a good retirement account. But like to me, none of that stuff really mattered to me because you know my parents worked their ass off for a long, long time to get us all these things. But you know, growing up as a teenager, I always felt like you know something was missing in my life and like I wasn't very happy as a teenager. But when I found jujitsu, it kind of like everything kind of turned around. Like it gave me a purpose and it gave me something that could be my own. I didn't have to rely on nobody to be a good jujitsu competitor. I just needed a few teammates. I need an instructor, but like I, it was more the idea that I could build this. I can work for this. That no matter who was on the mat, I can outwork them. And if I study enough, I can beat that person. And that was like my goal, like going through the ranks. Like that's like the great motivator when you're a younger belt. Like if you're a white belt, you got that blue belt that smashes you. I'm gonna get the guy one day. I like that guy, but I'm gonna get him. I know I can outwork him. I don't like him. any of them guys that smash. <laughs> yeah, me. I don't yeah. care. They're dicks. Doesn't matter if they're nice or not. I still want to fuck them up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, you sacrifice. You sacrifice so much, man. Even if you're like a high level competitor and you're like you're winning like worlds and stuff, you don't get no. <laughs> I, t- I, t- I joked to Larry Backless. I went to Boomo like a little while after I got my black belt. So I'm like, I go up to him like. So when do we get our RBJJF black belt check? Like, does that come <laughs> weekly? Does that come monthly? <laughs> <laughs> but no, you don't get nothing. You pay the IBJJF. You pay the black belt. Dub doesn't charge us for like a black belt. Like, but I swear to God, there's some schools out, out there will charge you $500 or $1,000 to get your black belt. Wow. Like, congratulations, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Looking back, do you think it's worth it? Would you do it again? Oh, absolutely. Jiu-Jitsu gave, jiu-jitsu gave me everything, man. Gave you a pretty girlfriend. Gave me a pretty girlfriend. <laughs> No, it gave me it gave me a life, man. Like before, I said in my like my black belt speech, like I uh, I separated my life in two like eras, like pre jujitsu, post jujitsu. Pre jujitsu, I did have a vice in music, like I started guitar when I was in middle school, and that gave me a vice. But like pre jujitsu, man, I don't like a lot of teenagers. You're angry, you know. You're kind of like lost and. Um, but I really saw no way out of it, and I was kind of like depressed, like going into like my adult years. I didn't really want to go to college, and the only reason I went to college because I needed health insurance because I had have a surgery. So like I kind of like had to go through this phase. I'm just like, ah, oh, shit. I don't know what the hell I'm gonna do in my life. But uh, yeah, once I found jujitsu, like it got it gives you that physical release at first, where it gets coming like that anger and anxiety out of you, and then gives you like the mental path where it's just like this is a great big puzzle, like. I always use the analogy in jiu-jitsu, like, jiu-jitsu is like getting dropped into the jungle with machete and being forced to survive because everything is just, you know, you get no light, everything is dark, and you get tangled up and you get snagged by these animals out of goddamn nowhere. <laughs> and, like, but if you survive along with your machete, you start chopping your way through the jungle, you start clearing a path. And it's just like, oh, well, there's a coconut tree over there. So you start chopping your path and you get to the coconut tree. It's like, well, now I know where they get coconuts. Well, where can I get some fucking water? Where do you get the acai from? Yeah. That's what we need to know. Acai. <laughs> yeah, Jawal's over there. Let's cut a path to Jawal. Or, and you can get like, after a while, you start like clearing yourself a civilization and eventually you build yourself a city. So, like, to me, a jujitsu city is just like every building or every structure, or every like resource is like a technique and got to build the transportation everywhere. And the transportation is your your transitions, which is something that Chuck always like talked about. 
transitions. And that's something I really learned from him. Everything in jiu-jitsu is about transition. It's something Professor Cyborg really stressed too. And that's how you'd be really efficient in your jiu-jitsu, I feel. It's not about clenching onto somebody super hard trying to hope they don't escape on you. It's about moving or when they get a slightly better position on them and going to somewhere we can put them in a really bad spot and make them work to get out. So they take an inch, you take back a foot. So like that's that's my thing. So you gotta figure out your transitions, your trans and your transitions to be like green energy transportation. It shouldn't be no clunker model T. It should be a it should be like a magnetic Japanese levitation train that just takes you there without so, any energy. Just so everyone knows, we haven't smoked any non tobacco product before we started <laughs> this podcast. But this is <laughs> Brandon may be drinking a little bit, but that's it. <laughs> I get very philosophical when I drink. Some people get stupid. It's your second beer. Let's count them. Uh, it's my it's my third. I have one at home. Yeah. What makes a blue belt? This is something I ask every black belt. What makes a blue belt? I hold I hold people in very high regard. A blue belt, I guess I, I guess I hold a purple belt way higher in regard than a blue belt. You know, anybody could be a blue belt. I think a blue belt is somebody that trains at least three times a week. They got to roll. If you don't roll, um, unless you got like some physical condition, again, you lack the physical thing that's necessary to really understand jiu-jitsu. You got to feel the push and pull of jiu-jitsu. Um, a blue belt is somebody that knows how to get an angle from close guard. A blue belt is somebody that understands how to work a few guard passes and do them well. They can have a good half guard pass. They don't need necessarily, they don't need to know how to bear and bolo. They don't need to know any fancy stuff, but they should understand the idea that you need to physically be in the dance of jiu-jitsu. You need to roll. You it takes two to tangle and drilling's good. Drilling's great. But you need to put your time in because you're never going to be a purple belt if you don't roll. I think you could be a blue belt if you just roll a little bit. But you're never going to be a purple belt or not a respected purple belt. You got to you got to really understand push-pull energy. And that doesn't exist in drilling. You can simulate it, but it's it's never going to happen. So um, same thing with like, you know, side control escapes. You can drill side control escapes, but... You know how you drill a side control technique and then it happens in real life. It's just like, it's different. Someone's committing all their weight to you and all their pressure trying to break your arm. Dusty's got good escape. She takes her fingernail, puts it right in your eye, <laughs> and then I she mean, gets up. She's I dirty. Beat you, so. you beat me every time we roll so far. So I mean, Yeah. So, you know, a blue belt doesn't need a world champion or something, but for me, like a blue belt is somebody that understands it's going to train and show some, show, show a little bit of grit and just the knowledge, just basic. You know, how to open up the close guard, how to pass a half guard, how to catch a couple submissions from side control and mount. You know, usually it takes about a year to two years of three to four times a week to get a blue belt to me. And, you know, it doesn't need to be special. Um, a purple belt, I'd like to see a little bit more from purple belts. To me, a purple belt should really understand how to flow. To me, a purple belt, I really don't got much respect for a purple belt that really just comes at you with all their athleticism. You can be tough. You can f- you can be as tough as a purple belt. You can f- um, grind like a purple belt, but I want to see the technique. And I will, I would very much give a purple belt to somebody who is showing me technique rather than somebody that's just like strong and maybe, you know, maybe they're coming from like an MMA kind of background where they're just used to grinding. Because in the long run, I, I know that guy who maybe is a little less athletic. He's going to be better than that guy. Because he, he understands jujitsu on a more fundamental level. And in the end, like, yeah, fundamentals are everything. They're everything in jujitsu. Fundamentals are how you have a f- efficient jujitsu. If you don't have fundamentals, you're going to gas out and you're going to gas out fast. Jose Flores. <laughs> no, I can tag him in this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jose's way better than he used to be. I'll go on that. Dude, Jose is. But he just, you know, he'll come at you. He'll come at you hard. <laughs> yeah. He's exactly what you just said. He's going to come at you hard with technique for about three minutes. <laughs> and he's going to be tired. The other day I was fanning with my gi top so he could get through the rest of his role. Yeah, what's with these guys? I don't know. <laughs> so you relax. What would you... Um, Let the other guy do the work. That's yeah. like my... Like, you know, it takes two to tangle. Like, you just got to put your... Like, jujitsu is like, to me, like, you got to go between the micro and the macro of, like, technique and, like... The philosophy of jiu-jitsu, like, sometimes I'm really looking at the gritty details, and then sometimes you're, like, you kind of, like, zone out. Like, 
Oh, it's like this. It's not that complicated. That's exactly how I do jujitsu all the time. I never get to the details. <laughs> I'm just like, ah, whatever. I just feel it. But I feel in my passing. It's just like, you know, I, I teach passing now. Like, you just got to... You just got to set the play, the play in motion. You got to get the guy chasing you. And that's why passing is a superior position than guard playing in theory. You, If I step my leg out and I get an angle on you, what do you got to do? You got to chase me. Well, if I got grips, then you chase me, and then I just redirect you. And it reminds me of that like, pirate ride from Darien Lake where it goes up and down and gains momentum. And eventually the, the momentum's so great, and this is what Leandro Lowe was brilliant at. Eventually, he just spins you like a top because you're forced to try to recompose your guard so hard that you're going to spin the guy. And then you got your angle. Hoffa Mendes, too. The Mendes brothers. Meow brothers. Like, unbelievable. Just catching momentum and spinning the guy and getting great angles. So, to me, like, when my, like I realized then that my passing game is now way better than my guard game because I got lazy over the years. And now, like, I don't want to work on my guard as much because the guard's exhausting. I like, think everyone should be on top, anyways. I'm yeah, I, I, my, I, I think I think all the time. I think passing spirit. I think, and I think a lot of people in gi, gi jitsu uh, get kind of like used to playing a guard, so their guard gets way better than their passing. But I feel like this is all because IBJJF. To be honest with you, I feel like the IBJJF really favors the guy on the bottom pulling guard. Well, I kind of know gi do is too. Like you got all the Donaher guys. Yeah, you know they pull guard and they pull right in the Ashi Guru army, and yeah. uh, they get their heel hooks. So it's not it's not there to. Passing needs to be like a blend of the old school and new school. It can't be, your passing can't be too loose. It can't be too grounded. You got to mix and match. Like, and that's something like, you know, the Mendes brothers were f- unbelievable at. Like, you know, they can pressure you and then switch the leg drag and kind of use their athleticism and their transitions to go around you. Same thing like Leandro Lowe, like just with his low drag and just that one arm leg drag just like you guys can't see but brandon's going through the motions right here in the studio oh, it's yeah. amazing <laughs> black belt level but like you know when you when you kind of zone out and it's like now i'm at like black like you kind of zone out and you kind of see it. it's just like you know jiu-jitsu is not that complicated it's really not you just gotta you just gotta acknowledge that you need to go with a flow as a cliche as it sounds that's what it really is all about like i'm not gonna try to resist somebody's energy because then i use my energy my whole game is just about making people expel their energy and tiring them out and then going around them keep putting them in bad position bad position so guys with great passing that's what they do even if the guy you know they're going against high level black belts so they're going to have a lot of energy and they're going to know how to counter this stuff but if you put somebody in folding pass make them really try to get out of it yeah maybe they expel like 10 percent of their energy like a health bar in a video game and then they go to play their guard again they're forced to put their hips back in the other direction to square back up, and you slap your knees the other way, fold them the other way. Well, that's another ten percent you just alleviated from the guard game. What did I do? I just moved my fat ass from left to right. <laughs> like I didn't have to do nothing. You did all the work for me. So that's that's the key. And so when I think about jujitsu at a high level, I'm not really thinking about like got a better deep half guard who's got a better you know leg drag. To me, it's about more like grips because whoever gets the grips sets the play in motion. And at that level, whoever sets the play in motion has the other guy chasing them. You get the other person chasing you, you're a step ahead. All you got to do is do is stay a step ahead. You just can't get lazy or unfocused. I like one thing. I've always taken this to heart when you said it. I'm not even sure when I heard you say it. Uh, a lot of the guys that train with you love it and they repeat it too. If you're attacking, they're reacting. So attack 100% of the time. I really try and instill that in the kids that I teach too. Yeah. And I really liked when you said that and it was... I think I was, I had to be brown belt by the time I heard you say that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of like what I think about MMA. I didn't I'm say like, it, Marcel Garcia did. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you say it to everyone that you teach, man, and people pick it up. And you should take credit for it, anyways. No one's going to know because no, uh, MG's not going to listen to this, I guarantee you. <laughs> what if he did, though? <laughs> if he did, what if then, a weird twist it was? Yeah. He'd probably come here and kick our yeah, asses. He'd, he'd come after you. <laughs> Brandon said it, so fuck you, MG. Yeah, exactly. I'm just saying. Brandon Muckle. I roll Brandon them, man. Muckle. <laughs> <laughs> you can find him on Facebook. If you need privates, look him up. Message him. <laughs> he's bigger than he looks on. He's bigger than he looks on video. <laughs> Is he? Oh yeah. You guys, it's a picture of me and my brother training with him. Mm-hmm. I spent a month there training as a kid. My, my brother popped in towards the end of the month, and yeah, we got like a picture. Marcel's in the middle. We got arms around him. I'm see. fucking like, I'm like so happy. I but see him roll. Marcel is fucking like thick, man. Is like, he? Yeah, like he's a middleweight man. He he he, he rolled at one eighty five. Wow! You look him at you look him on like uh the videos. It's like yeah, he always looks tiny. It's like a featherweight. Yeah. But no, you know he's 
stick. Even when he rolled with Josh, I seen a video of him and Josh rolling. I never seen that picture with you, but I seen a video of him and Ketri rolling, and he looked small. He looked the same size as Josh. Yeah. But Josh is putting on a little weight. Well, like, you know, you look at him from square on, yeah, it doesn't look much. You turn him to the side, it's like, boom. Yeah. He's got fucking, like, explosive legs, which, you know, it's great for his butterfly guard game and stuff. But All these guys are ass. huge. <laughs> when you feel a guy that's really good at jiu-jitsu, you can just feel how strong they are. It's, a, it's just like wrestling, man. Those... They look like they're not that big, not that strong, and they're phenomenal athletes, and they're incredibly strong. And yeah. their grip strength is, like, until you feel someone that's really good at jiu-jitsu grab your gi, you don't understand what a grip battle is. Yeah. And that's, like, again, that's, like, something that's so important at the high level, man. You can't let the guy grip you. Mm -hmm. That's what the judo players understand. Judo is their cousin, but a lot of jiu-jitsu players don't understand how important it is to defend the grips and get your own grips and counter grip. That's everything, man. The guy can't grip you, can't sweep you, can't submit you. Remember we had uh, Mark Coleman on, and he uh, talked about how strong Noguera's grips were, right. and he just couldn't get the grips off of his wrist. That's insane. That's yeah. Mark Coleman. Dude. He's nothing but a muscle on steroids, and he couldn't <laughs> break this guy's grip. Oh, yeah. This little Brazilian fat guy's grip. <laughs> yeah. Especially those Brazilians, man. Like, Well, it's old school Brazilian guys, man. They're tough as nails. They had to be. I got one more question I asked every black belt that I get in here that so we can hear the different answers. Uh-oh, I know what it is. What is it? <laughs> Chuck? No, he, we already talked about no, Chuck. No, 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 the first person in Western New York. That's not, I'm going to end on that one. Okay. The next one I'm going to ask. <laughs> I'm not even, you're the worst co-host ever, oh, Ray. I'm sorry. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you mess up every time. These jujitsu ones, he never talks. Jesus. It's just like the police ones. Like, you're not ever here for the police ones either. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Ray's got coke in his trunk and dead hookers right now. So oh, if anyone's listening live, come get it. Good thing we're not live. You <laughs> I'm being shanghai <laughs> Anyways, no, you're not being shanghai um, what, what do you think between the emphasis on jiu-jitsu? Should it be more, a little bit more towards self-defense since it's still a martial art? Or should it all be about rolling? And, you know, you roll different in sports jiu-jitsu than you're going to if there's punching and kicking, obviously. I mean... You fought MMA, you know the difference. What do you think the emphasis should be, especially like through Blue Belt? I think there's some good, th good things to know for self-defense, man, but what I don't like is katas. And I feel like a lot of jujitsu self-defense kind of acts as a kata. And it, it's not bad because it gives you an idea of what could happen. Someone throws a punch at you. But I, I, got, I got issues when people throw like wide haymakers and you're supposed to block and like do something off it because that's not how a fight works, man. Like a fight is happens... When you enter a fight, it's like you kind of go in like kind of like underwater, and it's like it's a very difficult to get adrenaline. So the only way to really get used to defending yourself, yes, you should understand. Yes, you should be taught the concepts like keeping your hands up and distance control and stuff, and how to stand up properly, like a technical stand up. But and you sh you should know takedowns. I think takedowns are something that are very necessary. If you're gonna learn how to properly defend yourself, you need to be rolling, man. There's nothing that can get you used to used to a fight than live rolling. So, you know, you can be the self-defense king, you know, every aspect of like, oh, the guy does this, guy does that. But the truth is, man, until you go against somebody at full speed and full strength and someone's trying to smash you, like, you're never going to get used to a self-defense situation. Like, that only comes with sparring. So I think Dan Luke heard uh, Trump and Dan from Bray Jiu-Jitsu, like, you know, he said something like, in defense that a sport jujitsu guy couldn't defend themselves properly on the street. And he's just like, dude, like take your average competitive, like blue belt. There's so many savages on the blue belt scene. Now your average blue belt probably can go pretty far at the black belt or brown belt level. Like 10 years ago, the game's just so different now. It's like, you imagine you take your average lightweight blue belt world champion, you put him on the street even though he's never taken a self-defense class, that guy would slaughter anybody on the street. Slaughter him. That guy knows how to take people down. And I guarantee you, any hobbyist at that guy's gym knows how to take anybody down and beat him up as long as he's sparring. Now, if you take somebody that doesn't roll and just goes through the motions, a technique, and wants their, they want their next stripe or next belt without actually working for it, that guy ain't going to be able to, I guarantee you, like, he might be able to get away with it. I'm not saying he won't. He probably have more knowledge than the average guy in the street. But he's not going to be used to the adrenaline. He's not going to be used to the push and pull and the energy transfer of jujitsu. And that's what it's all about. 
you got to conserve energy by yielding to energy. And if you're not used to that, then you're not doing jujitsu. You're fighting. Like, jujitsu is about yielding to energy and going with somebody's motions. To me, fighting in the kind of like that primitive sense is trying to transfer your energy to the other person. Jiu-jitsu is about absorbing energy and yielding it to somewhere else and taking advantage of it. So if someone takes like a really strong grip on me and something Sensei Eric told, like, told me when I was like doing judo with him, if I gripped him too hard, he's like, why are you gripping so hard? Like you're too tense. You're wasting energy. Relax. Relax, Jose. Yeah. Put the, <laughs> put the move in motion and let it come to you. So if someone comes at me hard and they push into me, well, they're going, they're going beyond my head. Let's say from a close guard position. Well, I know I can go Tomonagi or I can go Pendulum Sweep. I don't need to push that guy away to create distance. And that's something everybody needs to know. That's something only can be learned on the mat. And if you're going to defend yourself in a self-defense situation, above anything else, you got to understand that. And it's good to know like how to block a punch and how to do all this stuff. But again, jujitsu is a dance and you need... Two people to tangle, and you need to understand that um, that back and forth energy. And if you don't, your jujitsu will never reach its full potential. I do have to say, personally, I've taken karate classes, and as a female, obviously self defense is always a concern. But it's not until I started doing jujitsu where I felt like I could actually protect myself. Really? Yes, really. I don't believe that at all. No, it's true. I feel like <laughs> with karate, it's also like there's a dance, but it's not as full contact. And in college, I did some of um, the MMA and kickboxing classes. But I think because most of the time, especially for women, if somebody's going to come after you and it's going to be a self-defense situation, you're going to be really close to another person. And I think the only thing that can simulate that is jiu-jitsu. I think you are the most savage female I've ever <laughs> rolled with in my entire life. I don't believe that you couldn't defend yourself without uh, you'd jiu-jitsu. Be surprised. It's jiu-jitsu. It is jiu-jitsu. You are so savage. <laughs> but see, that's the thing with jiu-jitsu. Like, I feel like in boxing, if the guy's bigger, like, I'm not going to be able to knock him out. I'm tiny. But I feel like in jiu-jitsu, size doesn't matter. It really is about technique. I would say that's very true. Um, I rolled with Dusty before my fight, and I was actually embarrassed. I almost had to cry. <laughs> I really tried to match her technique for technique, and after about three minutes, I just started aping her, and it didn't really help much. And then she poked me in the eye, and I cried. <laughs> That was pretty much how a role goes. I can tell that you guys are dating because you have a very similar style to Brandon. You just attack, 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 dominate, attack, sweep, attack. It's because it's like what Brandon said. If somebody is busy defending your attacks, then they're not busy attacking you. What do you think about dating in the gym, Brandon? Um, <laughs> I'm all for it. I'm for polygamy in the gym. And, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I got nothing against it, man. Um, as long as it's nothing like... You know, cultish. You know, every now and then, your story comes out where some like creepy black belt is like kind of creating like a cult for himself and like you know, taking <laughs> touching a, taking girls a, and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. taking a, taking advantage of like you know students and stuff. And that's actually been going capitalizing on. Capitalizing off of it with some creepy what? sexual shit. I got no problem with that. I I think it's fine. Um, and the problem is if you, people break up, then what happens? You know, I think I think it's a shame if someone like stops jujitsu because they broke up with somebody, then they don't have anywhere to train and they feel awkward about it, but I wouldn't people like each other. I got, I got, it's fine. It's not, it's not, it's not a corporate work environment. They might hold on to the choke a little longer. Yeah. I feel like in the reverse though, like I feel like it's a bonding experience for us and it's something we can talk about at home. Something we can do together. I feel like you always push me to be better than if we weren't dating. Cause I feel like I love jujitsu, but there's times at home when I don't want to go, and you'll be like, oh, and you'll say something very sarcastic that'll make me realize I should go. Like, oh, oh I forgot, go. like, you were... Here we go. <laughs> I forgot you were a black belt. You don't need to train today. And I... <laughs> then I will train, because then I'm like, he's right. I should train. <laughs> well. So I think it's a good way of pushing You're the embodiment out. of somebody that works hard and listens. That's all it takes. You just got to work hard and listen to your instructors. Wow, well, I feel like I'm doing a love connection thing here. <laughs> Like, this is kind of a good podcast. This is turning into something different, but <laughs> I like it. <laughs> they're drinking. They're being honest. I'm not trying to break well, she, you guys up. She's but. like some way like, you know, like there's so many people 
in the MMA and jiu-jitsu world who would rather take a Facebook selfie at the gym than actually train hard and not take a selfie. And that's like the thing I really try to get people away from. Like, forget your ego. Forget the amount of likes you can get. Yeah, we all like Facebook likes. I get that. It's nice. But, like, what, what are you here for, man? The confidence will come. All the good things in jiu-jitsu will come if you work for it. If you just want to be the guy that comes in, does the half amount of reps I want you to do, kind of listen, maybe ask a question here or there, and then roll one round and go. Great. It's better than not coming, but, like, I just, I just hate the person that goes online after that. Like, oh, we fucking did this. We did 100 rounds, and der, 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 and der, 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 we did this, and der. Hashtag 500 things. <laughs> like, dude. I like the accent you went into, by the way. I know. That was very, very. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. seems like you're making fun of MMA people with brain damage. I'm just saying. <laughs> Mickey. No, it could, be any- it could be anybody. It could be anybody, man. It could be jujitsu people. It could be kickboxers. It doesn't matter. But, like, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, you know, bullshit, like, bullshit walks. Like, and the truth, the truth is there. Like, it just... The guys that rise to the top are the guys that are working. And the more you're talking, the less you're working. And the, the proof is in the pudding, man. You put the work in, you're going to get better. Stop making excuses, you're going to get better. You know, every, you know, excuses are a dime a dozen these days. And, you know, sometimes after a loss, we all go through, like, a uh, moment excuses. Like, oh, this happened, that happened, this happened. I've been guilty of it plenty of times. But the difference is, do you take... Three months off after your train, after your your match or your fight, and you go home and you don't do nothing for three months, then you come back to the gym and take another fight without really training. Mm-hmm. I'm patting Rand his shoulder. If you can't hear that, guys. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. No, yeah, like to me, like that's like that's the difference between someone that gets really in touch with martial arts, like the real martial arts. Do you come back right to the gym when you lose a fight? If the answer is yes, within like a week you come back to the gym, you're probably pretty committed, man. If you're the person that, you know, has been posting on Facebook every single day leading up to your fight and not really training and skipping classes and not rolling and not sparring and not listening to your instructors thinking you know better than them and then you lose and then you avoid the gym for two months, then you come back and you start the whole process over. That's the kind of stuff I do not like. And, like, it's not the way to getting good at something. You got to fail. You got to fail often. And the way you do that is sparring. You got to fail if you want to be a competitor. You got to fail over and over. Just the way I did taking shots to the solar plex, losing my breath, and having Eric Herbert tell me to get the fuck up. <laughs> Just the way Chuck Anselm told me when I couldn't pass the guard at Abu Dhabi. He told me you got to pass the other side. You got to fail. You got to do this. Way I got smashed by Larry Backless up and down the mats every day, and I still do. <laughs> you know, it, it you gotta fail. Man, listen you to you, f- I should be good, but I still suck. I was gonna say, yeah, the moral of that story is that I will the never Iron Man. Not you are the Iron Man, dude. <laughs> hey, Caveman, you gotta take privates. Yeah. I know, I gotta take privates from Brandon to get good. That's the moral yeah. of the story. You are or the like every day you don't want to go in, just call him, and he'll be like, What's your excuse? Oh, there is none. <laughs> I don't think there's been a day where I don't want to go in. Really, the gym is like my sanctity. I exactly. like to go there. But I feel like so many people have like because they never let go of their ego. They're not. They're afraid to get smashed on the mats or in the cage, so they never let go. So they never gonna have that billing period. It's always about defending what they have. So someone like me and you, we get our ass kicked a ton of times, so we're able to grow. We're able to build. But if you don't, if you're not willing to put yourself out there and let go, you're never gonna grow. It ain't gonna happen. And that's something like like what a really good jiu-jitsu gym is all about. You get that hot shot blue belt. Things are all great. If there's higher belts there, they're like, okay, well, now we need to start being serious with this guy. He thinks he's better than us. And they'll break the guy down. The next time something that needs to happen, because now we'll see. Like, well, in a good way. Like, you know, break him down in a good way and support him. Be like, okay, now this is what you need to do. You understand? Like, you need to quit talking sh- quit talking shit. Stop acting like you're better than everybody. Stop kicking my what ass, you need to Dusty. Because, you know, you recognize it. You can't you can't do this alone in this sport. That's true. That's actually one of my favorite things is when a white belt guy comes in and they're really big and they're like, "Oh, I can do anything because I'm really huge." That's 
one of the best feelings when you as a blue belt, me as a blue belt, is tiny, and then they realize, like, oh, I actually need to practice, and then I can get better. Do you ever feel like someone tries to hurt your girl, and then you gotta go beat them up? <laughs> Not often, but... <laughs> Every now and then you see somebody do somebody do something really really stupid. Mickey Gaskins. Not just Mickey. There's some big guys no, sometimes that come in. It's just some some people are just some people are just crazy, man. Pick somebody up. They try to slam. Them, they try to neck crank somebody, or just like you know, they just do something stupid. Or try like a heel hook in the gi without like any like just a no no in gi jiu jitsu unless you talk about it first. You know, just going around heel hooking people in the gi unless it's like you know talked about prior. So you and you see Unless like, you're with Dub, because Dub's gonna heel hook you in the gi. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah, I got no problem with heel hooks in the gi. Just you know, let me know if you're prior safe because words. nine times out of ten, it's kind of understood we don't heel hook in the gi. There's no safe words with Dub. <laughs> He's just gonna sweat on you. That's the safe <laughs> word. Yeah. Hide, hide your feet. <laughs> what the hell were we talking about? Talking about if you feel it necessary to protect me. Oh, not just no, you. Not Nicole. really. Pat protects Nicole all the time. <laughs> Right, I can myself. Sometimes I have to smash people when I go up to Karis a little too hard. Yeah. Well, oh, but I would, you know, same thing. I would, I would do it like anybody else. Like, if I see someone bigger, t- like, really taking advantage of somebody, like, smaller, you know, a 250 pound guy versus, like, a 130 pound guy. If I see someone taking advantage of that, like, that, I don't like that. Because chances are, especially as a white belt, they're using their strength and their size. So I don't like that, period, because that's not jujitsu. So. What I try to do, and I try to do, I always try to do it in the nicest way possible. I, I don't go out of the way to, to smash somebody. But, like, what I try to do, I try to show somebody the power of jujitsu with the least amount of energy possible. Because that's the best way to do it. Because that guy come at you full speed. Thank you. you Gave me all the energy I need. Sweep you. Get on top. You're trying to push me away from your guard. You're pushing in one direction. Well, redirect it. Go around it. And what you hope is they tap into that. Like, oh, that's kind of what jujitsu is like it's not about how big and strong i am it's about my technique strength is not superior strength is fleeting strength will go away but then you clench your muscles for a minute you'll probably lose about half your power in that minute so it's it's fleeting it's not good so above anything else that's what you know i as an instructor need to teach people is your strength and your size it doesn't matter it has attributes that can work for you. Same way my flexibility works for me. But it ain't going to help you in the long run. You can go way better if you just let go of it and try to roll like an average sized person. If you're going to try to roll like a Hulk, then it's not good. It's going to be detrimental to your improvement in the long run. Do you feel like man enforcers are kind of their day is done? Like I remember at Chuck's sometimes Chuck would give you the, like where he snaps his fingers and it means you better take care of the guy that's. Uh, taking care of people on the mat. Do you think? Um, no, I remember Chuck had me do that a couple times. Yeah, me too. That was <laughs> my role. Has if Chuck snapped his fingers like this, that meant that you were supposed to try and hurt the guy. I mean, there's times he told me to actually hurt that guy because uh, he's going too hard. Yeah, you know, it's 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 the debate between the business side and like the enforcement side. You know, Chuck was Chuck is a man of his morals and his code above anything else. Man, you know, I respect him for that. It's just old school jiu-jitsu. That's how it, it was when he came up, and that's how he put it. And it's different where we're at now. So I was just kind of, where do you feel yeah, stand on I mean, that? now we got like, I mean, being a place we are now with 400 people, man, it's just like you see new people all the damn time. And it's just like, I think the best thing we could do in this situation, like, and you know, it doesn't happen often. There was a few weeks ago with an open mat where we had somebody come in, and it was just kind of like. You really, saw put that dude down <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, it was kind of nuts. Um, but, you know, for your average person who's not completely insane, you know, the best thing you do is, you know, try to provide a positive environment and make it friendly. Like, I think the thing is, a lot of people come with jujitsu and, you know, they think they're going to be fighting and they think they're going to be, like, you know, in this high, tense situation. And it can be, but, you know, the way I look at jujitsu now, I look at jujitsu more like a puzzle in chess rather than, like, fighting, you know? I don't, I don't really see it as, like, even, like, combat sport anymore. So, like, you know, I'm, I'm way beyond that point of, like, just, like, going into it, like, oh, I got to beat this guy up. Like, you know, but that's how a lot of people think. And a lot of people have their ego on the line when it comes to that stuff. So when it comes to, like, the mad enforcers, like, you know, I don't want to make anybody feel bad for trying to win because it's, it's human instinct to try to win. And it's human instinct not to try to get your, you know, 
your masculinity smashed or your femininity smashed on the mat like like that. So like I try to I try to do it in a positive way and you know I try to give a little guidance after like if I need to do that. So if I see like a new guy go spazzing out, I'll be like, hey, you know, let's let's roll. And you know I'll usually like, hold the guy off until he expels his energy and then I look for my opportunity to sweep and I'll get on top. And then you just try to be loose in jiu-jitsu. I'm not clenching. I'm not using muscle. I'm just putting my body where it needs to be, where I can neutralize an opponent's energy. And once they kind of, like, you know, gas themselves out, then it's just like, all right, hopefully they get an idea of what this is all about. And, you know, that's, 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 the, that's the shitty thing about getting better at jiu-jitsu is you, get, you start gaining weight. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I've noticed that a lot. Like, all the black belts in the area have really put on a lot of weight. <laughs> No offense, even you. Like, I never thought that was going to happen to you. Like, now yeah. you're good, you're getting a little bit. I always thought you were going to walk around 135 pounds with abs, dude. You work out so goddamn much. Oh, yeah. yeah look at my fighting days. Yeah. Oh, MMA days are fucking great. Your competition days in jiu-jitsu were the same thing. You were always yeah, lean late, and muscular. Oh, dude, I get down to light feather. Yeah. I think I'm probably, I'm probably 160 now. Jesus. <laughs> Do you think that being heavy in jiu-jitsu helps? Because, look, we're little guys, man. There's big guys toss us around all the nah. time. No, it doesn't help. Um, you don't think it helps? So, here's here's my here's thing. the thing. I think I okay. I think I'd actually do better at lightweight than featherweight. I would cut. I would fight at light feather. I mean, training wise, not like actually competing, like just training day to day, like being heavier. Um, it, every, every, I feel like every weight class has its advantages and disadvantages. Here's my thing. I feel like when I train, if I'm eating good and I'm eating a little bit more fatty stuff and I'm not cutting weight. I feel much better. I feel less likely to be injured because I'm eating like a normal person. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like, you know, when you're cut up and you're ripped up and yeah. you're ready to compete. Dehydration is no good for you in any any sense of it. But for like me, like, you know, when I would go compete at like Worlds and Pans, like being at light feather, like I felt like going up to like, literally like, until right before my match, like I would feel like shit because in IBJJF, you, you go in the bullpen they weigh you in, and then you have about 10 minutes to have something to drink or eat before your match. So it doesn't really do nothing for you. It's not like you can digest that food, really, but it's psychological. So once I had that sip of Gatorade or whatever and go on the mat, like, that sip of Gatorade to, like, it made you feel way better. But at Light Feather, like, I always felt way stronger, and I felt I think speedier. Gatorade owes you 25 bucks right now. <laughs> What's that? Gatorade owes you about 25 bucks right now. Yeah, Again, good good product water. placement. But what like, are you drinking right now? We got, we got plugged down too. Oh well, what do we got? We got uh, we stopped the village uh, beer merchant. Um, a little bit of everything. Actually, yeah. I think they need to step their game up, frankly. Yeah. Oh, we got we got some Guinness. We got some Brewmaster Jack. We got some Upstate Brunch breakfast ale. I think it's brunch ale. Whatever. And we also had the best donuts in the business oh, from yeah, Paula's, Paula's Donuts. donuts. Ray, you got to hook us up with Paul's. All right, back to the topic. What were we talking about? We were talking about being fast, better for jujitsu. Oh, yeah. So I honestly feel like, like at Featherweight, like when I, I think I did pans at Featherweight once, and I didn't do very well, man. Like I felt like it neutralized my speed, yet I wasn't big enough to compete with the people that were cutting off like 170. But honestly, when I feel like with lightweights, like I feel like with lightweights, I'm kind of like fast enough to kind of get like a jump on them and kind of like, so I feel like I'd rather be one or the other, but like featherweight was always kind of like hit or miss for me. Light featherweight was like, which is 141 in jiu-jitsu with a gi on. Like I, f I felt pretty good there. It was just a pain in the ass getting down to that weight. I feel good at in the 50s when I'm walking around in the 50s. And I'll cut down to 38 to do 41 too. You're talking about, th were you talking about 125 at some point? I was. I could make that too, dude. Where the hell, where the hell was your training camp, Auschwitz? <laughs> <laughs> That was when I was just came out of college. I didn't have any muscle mass at all. I was just super skinny. It's different. It's different than it is now. Now I, I couldn't make it. Yeah, I think I can make well, 35 still, though. You're like 5'10", aren't you? 5'11". 5'11"? Yeah. I can make 35. <laughs> I, I just don't think... That. It's like one mix hot plug getting down to 125. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. Yeah, that That's terrifying. Way? That's terrifying. It is. Can you imagine him at 125? Who's going to beat him? I don't know. Nobody. But he likes Funyuns, so he couldn't make it. He likes funyuns. He does. Uh, the, Literally like, the worst chips. Four days before. <laughs> they are the worst chips. Four <laughs> days before the fight, dude, he's eating funyuns. I was like, if you miss weight, I'm going to make fun of you forever. <laughs> and he missed weight, so I can make fun of him forever. Uh, Even though he kicks my salt. ass every time. Dude, why, why salt, though? Don't do the salt. 
Because he likes fine. You can get away with a lot. Like you probably get you get away with sugar way better than you can get solid at that point. I'm a sucker for gummy worms. Ew. Oh yeah. Oh, I, 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 I hate gummy candy. I love gummies. Gummies are the best. I hate gummy candy. I just lost a little respect for Dusty. Every, she doesn't like gummies. <laughs> every good bar shift, you know, Saturday Sunday, I go to the store, get like a big pack of like. Lightsaber gummies, the oh, neon that's ones. So disgusting. All right, I got a couple. Get my Starbucks energy drink. A couple more questions before we get out of here. Joe Rogan thinks being high in training is a great thing. You talked about. I've never <laughs> actually done marijuana in my life, although I might have to break that since Ray's got a good hookup now. Um, <laughs> should probably edit that. <laughs> I'm not gonna edit that. He's gonna get arrested. He's got some dead hookers, cocaine. Ray brought some marijuana. dynamite pills tonight. Yeah, <laughs> Ray's got some good pain pills. We're eating all right now. Anyways, do you think? I don't know if you ever train high, but do you feel like it gives you? It's better to train on marijuana or not? Um, everybody's different. Um, I I, re- I really, I'm not a social smoker, and I do smoke. <laughs> Believe it or not, I actually don't smoke that much weed. I believe that. Um, oh, I thought it was going to be, believe it or not, I'm not that social. Younger, younger, <laughs> me, younger me, yes. Um, but I, I always felt like uh, it gave me kind of like that feeling of being underwater. And like, it, it didn't help me th- see anything clearer. Like, I feel like some people get kind of like, like a revelation that like points and like helps people along and help people relax. But for me, like, I, for me, it was always better to go in like sober and just feel like stronger that way. Ray's showing me pictures of marijuana as I broke my mic. I'm trying to reattach it to the table. <laughs> All right, I fixed my mic. I didn't break it anymore. I was talking about training uh, under the influence of marijuana. I know um, some guys at the gym, especially, um, I'm going to throw Morgan under the bus here because he smells like weed all the time. Um, <laughs> Probably good. I, I wanted to have a talk with Morgan for a long time, and he was scared to come in. So I'm going to keep throwing him under the bus until he comes in here he and I can talk to him. Now. I know. <laughs> I want to get this kid. Listen, so one thing I will say, when people are smoking it, they tend to have a less cardio than the people that aren't. So, I mean, there's a lot of forms who ingest it. And I got no, I got absolutely nothing against marijuana. Absolutely nothing. But doesn't it slow your reaction time? So I don't know because no. I, I think that black belts and like high-level guys are so oh, far yeah. ahead anyways. It just opens up your creativity. Yeah, yeah. Any high-level... Not any, but a lot of the high level people I've ever seen train at any belt level, especially on the Oceanside cities, Miami, LA. So many of them smoke. Like it's it's, it's such a Brazilian thing. Like it's just like that's jujitsu is so related to surf culture that it's just like something a lot of people do. And because you know it's way better than you for alcohol than alcohol. Um, I can't go in there drunk either. Well, I'm messing train drunk. I don't train drunk anymore <laughs> <laughs> the black belt means you don't train drunk anymore no a lot of people in this world need the release and so people smoke um i don't think it makes your jujitsu better i think some people who are more anxious can, it can kind of calm them down and relax them or kind of see things in a different perspective which is helpful but you know everybody's different i want to say it works for everybody um I've known people who train under other drugs. I've known people that train under psychedelics. Again, I know people that train on steroids. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, if you do that, fuck you. <laughs> Especially in jiu-jitsu. They don't test, man. I would do they, great they, babe. They do in black belt, like IBJJF. Like I know me, I know the one we all got popped. I think uh-huh. even Galval got popped. What do they test for? Do they test for everything or just for... I don't um, know, man. It's a bunch of Brazilians running it. I mean, that's... <laughs> Oh, dude, it's just, it's different down there. <laughs> it is different. I mean, it, it, it's, it's getting more, cra- like, you know, it's getting more cracked down a lot of, like, countries, but, like, like a pharmacy down there is not like a pharmacy up here. Like, mm-hmm. you have access to different things where something is kind of perceived more as a supplement down there is perceived as a steroid up here. Yeah. But, Same thing for weight cutting, too, because they're yeah. allowed to use diuretics a lot, different, yeah. a lot different diuretics, and, I mean... Like ephedrine, like... like Ephedrine was in like shit like hydroxycut and like right. they put on the and like that would give you like you pop that, hot for that now yeah you that's can't what happened to um Nagara yeah he popped hot for um I don't know if it was ephedrine but he popped hot for diuretic that's not legal here that is legal there it's still ways around and people people always like you know find the analog and going like down that route and but it's it's just, it's just like I, I I hate it and like it's it's rampant in jujitsu you know it is. 
because once you get past 25, man, the idea of training three times plus a day with sparring, it's pretty hard. Like, it's not easy. And, like, you see people that are shredded and training 100% every day. Unless you got, like, a certain genetic, man, like, I don't, like... Like you're Roll Romero and you like God and hate the gays. <laughs> God, I... <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> You know, Romero's like, kissing everybody after the fight. That's you know, follow Portuguese. You remember what the polar bear said, right? What's that? <laughs> hey, all the Latin, all the Latin guys like to kiss. Oh yeah, I don't know. Down in South America, dude. If Romero knocked me out and then he kissed me, I wouldn't be mad. But if anyone else did, I'd, I'd be pretty be pissed. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the the one meow brother got popped, and I I tell the story about a lot, but like how I was in LA the one time, and the the meow brothers were staying at the same gym I was, and they had a whole Cicero Costa team. And uh, staying at Trump Dance in Bray and uh, Bray Jiu Jitsu, he's an awesome guy. If you guys are ever in LA, go check him out. Um, but yeah, he had a whole team there, and it's just like, you know, the Meow Brothers are absolutely incredible. And you know, I don't, I'm sure it's just like a different way of thinking down there. But like, you know, the one Meow brother got popped for something, and he had to relinquish his world championship medal. But when I was there, it was for the Pans, and the they won. I think they both took gold at Pans. And 10 hours later at the gym, it's 5 a.m. And I wake up, I'm sleeping on a beanbag chair and I wake up to the sound of them training bare and bolos <laughs> 10 hours after they won the Pan Americans. <laughs> like your average person is not training the next day. And I'm not saying like, if you're training that much and putting in the body that much stress, like you need days off. And I think they said they have one day off, but like the amount of times they train, like Steroids and jujitsu are not necessarily great. Like it's not about building mass and stuff and building being stronger. It's about recovery. You can get your muscles and joints to recover and get that artificial relief. Then you can train three times a day, and that's what it's all about, man. It's getting your reps in and making those techniques tighter. It's not about like just like building that like weightlifter strength no it's about like just getting more reps and more rolls and going to deeper waters every roll without getting tired look what the trt does for the guys that fight i mean they made it illegal now but oh, yeah. i mean it keeps you young um, yeah the testosterone replacement is the way to go if you're gonna really keep fighting and, you know I, I get pissed off about like um how they ban like ivs for like rehydration because you you got to find a middle ground man i, I don't think you should be able to t you know anything steroid related is should be illegal, but why can't you take an IV to replenish yourself? And we know the dangers of what it is like to get hit in the head when you're dehydrated because you lose that fluid in your brain. It's more trauma. It's less cushion. So, like, why can't people, like, I don't understand why we ban IVs for, for weight cutting. Like, yeah, we, we don't want people to cut weight. Well, everybody's going to cut weight, dude. Like, you take I, some poor person from, like, you know, the ghetto or, like, another country or just somebody that's trying, really trying to make it. They're going to cut weight. They're going to take every advantage they can. Everybody's doing it. So, like, you're not going to let them take an IV to replenish their brain? Like, I hate that shit, man. They should definitely... Cutting weight, I agree, is, like, a horrible thing in MMA. And if you're going to cut weight, you should let them do the IVs. I really think everyone should do the hydration testing. You have to be so hydrated when you make weight, like, a 1FC... Uh, ben Askren talked on the Joe Rogan podcast a whole bunch about this. When they weigh in at 1FC, they have to be hydrated when they weigh in. Okay. If you have to pass a hydration test yeah, and still make weight. So it's like everyone's fighting two weight classes higher, but, you know, everyone's hydrated. Yeah. And that's the way, that's the only way to make weight cutting yeah. be safe. That would be good. Would because, like you know, people are going to die weight cutting because how far are you willing to chase your goals? If you're not willing to die yeah, to chase your goals, exactly. you're not going to win. When you drop out of high school and you're like 10 years into this shit, man, like, what are you going to do? What are you going to go, go to work at like, I'm a 40 year old, I'm a 40 year old, like, like guy with a job and a family and I'm willing yeah. to die to make this weight. You know, you know what I mean? If you're not willing to do that, <laughs> my wife's looking at me, but I mean, that's, that's the level of like craziness you need to have to succeed in this sport. And only the 1% are going to succeed. Two people are going to go in and yeah. one person's going to lose every time. Oh man. And Muckles just made a mess. <laughs> God damn it. Oh, at least it's on his pants and not my First floor. Up, it's it Guinness. Floor. It's nitrogen. And that, it tastes great. And good. it smells great. So That's all right. We like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, I just... Oh, man. 
I, I, I like right. that's the thing about the IBJJF. It's just like <laughs> they, I hate the I, like that's that's another group that gets no, IBJJF again. They bring the like best people in and they'll produce the best gi tournaments. Weight cutting is another issue I have with them. I don't understand why like, there can't be three hour window where you can weigh in. Why does that have to be right before your match? That's horrible because everybody is cutting weight. Maybe what? Maybe five percent of the people aren't cutting weight. They're just fighting at their natural body weight. That's the exception. That's not the rule. Like, if you're competing at that level, you got to cut weight. Um, Everyone's always going to take every advantage of every rule that yeah. you can do. That's what competition and, is about. And then what they do, it's like they make you weigh in right before your match. Oh, yeah, that's that's great for your body. And you know, like, you're not doing nothing proactive to change this. You're not doing anything to make it proactive or change it for the athletes. But yet you keep making people do it. So why can't you make it like like something like any of these tournaments, like uh, I think Grappling Industries or like one of these. Tournaments. I love the way Josh runs it. Actually, we all weigh in in the morning. Yeah. And at, at one time, and What's that's the it issue? for the day. What is the issue with that? They just don't want to do it. Like it's just like I understand they have a schedule to keep, but you can create, you can make it happen. So and then actually make everything run faster too because you can weigh in before the yeah. competition starts. Everyone's gonna do that. Yeah. If you can weigh in at seven in the morning and the tournament starts at nine, everyone's gonna be weighed in by seven thirty. I yeah. guarantee it. Everyone that's cutting weight. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they got an issue with like um They don't want no one to throw up on the mat. Worse, maybe they, maybe they got an issue like where people are changing geese, like one geese heavier than the other, right. and then you go the going to the bullpen later and then you got different gi on right or which, you got which, like, I, which i understand at that level it makes a difference what kind of gi you have on you can't have a legal gi i just it, it, it always drove me nuts Being you can really make your gi to make weight too and you can like cut all the seams out you could have it be super light to weigh in and but yeah 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 you know and then if you could change your gi it's not gonna rip yeah you know but i mean that's Let the only advantage the... make them weigh in without the gi what does it matter you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, oh, yeah. That's something you can do too. Yeah, you just take the whole thing out of the going equation. Going to a tent with some Brazilian yeah. guy. Yeah. <laughs> Naked. <laughs> <laughs> Let me touch this for you, man. I think. Ah, bro. 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 Ha. What's wrong with you, man? Not I got La- Jamaican La- instead La- of Brazilian, La- but La- whatever. La- 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 yeah, I, was, I was about to say that. You got Jamaican. Yeah, that's the only accent I got. I'm sorry. I'm white. I can't help it. I never trained anyone cool. You are the greatest gringo I've ever seen. No. No respect. No respect. <laughs> That's the only thing I do is turn an R into an H. Oh, yeah. My name is Heyman. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about all this shit that's going on now with um, uh, Hickson and all that stuff? The um, It's coming out that they got guys that are like bad touching people and it's kind of covering up a little bit. I haven't heard this. What, what's going you on? know, like the Hickson guy had it in his federation. He had some guy that was um, bad touching <laughs> kids. And um, they kind of covered it up. He was getting emails about it, and he didn't really do anything about it until it came out publicly. Well, I don't know how rampant. I don't know if it's at like the Catholic Church, but like, I don't know how rampant it is. But uh, I don't. I don't prove of it. <laughs> all right, I'll edit all that out because that was the worst bit ever. <laughs> I guess it's good that it came out. Yeah, I mean it was good it came out. Uh, yeah, me and God had uh, a big thing about it. We talked about it for like five or six minutes. No, dude, it's just. I hate to be a pessimist, but any anytime you got people in power like watching over kids, man, like you need somebody looking over that guy. Well, it's not just kids; people in power will take advantage of that power no matter who. Yeah, I, think I mean, we've it's seen been that in Hollywood. I think we've seen that yep. everywhere. Yeah, and the black belts have been doing it to other people for to girls too yeah. for a bit. I mean, that's yeah, come out, especially. It is a thing, especially. Uh, uh, Lloyd Irving. Lloyd Irving was Lloyd a really Irving bad one for a while. It was those three guys that were. It wasn't yeah. really per se him, but. No, it's uh. <laughs> you should definitely. Yeah, probably no, like feminist, or, feminist organization. Yeah. Wait, so black belts were touching women? Is what you're saying? No, they're taking advantage of women, and they were like uh, from the Lloyd academy. Jiu-Jitsu? The Lloyd Irving team yeah. had a controversy for a while. Mm-hmm. A bunch of people left. Like, they were raping the girls. They weren't like well, taking it's, advantage it's of them. Keenan Cornelius left. Is it the girls who were training with them? Yes, it was. It was, okay. it was girls that were training with them. Yeah. Oh. Poor Shit. girls. I, I heard. I found out. Uh, <laughs> A taekwondo school over here in Buffalo was doing that. Yeah, I, a taekwondo <laughs> school. <laughs> so poor girls, they had to do it with a taekwondo guy. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. It's always the hacks, man. It's, it's usually the fucking hacks that are doing it. Yeah, <laughs> it's always the kids' coach too. Yeah, but I'm not. It's not like that at Western New York MMA. I'm the kids' coach <laughs> there, the so we're safe there. You come to our school. I know it's like the always sunny episode. <laughs> I'm gonna go in my dressing room over here. The kids are going to the dressing room over there. <laughs> 
That's always a problem. But I that, think that, that, that one guy was a pervert. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? The, the kids um, coach. Did we the, have a coach? Oh, the, the karate guy. JJ? <laughs> I had a I had a French teacher in summer grade that was fucking diddling kids. But no, no, I thought Western New York MMA had before you and Matt. Yeah, the the the, the karate guy. Yeah. If he wasn't really touching kids, he was just a creepo kind of. At the, at the, at the, at the, at the Christmas party, them? he came in with a girl was, who was like six, seventeen years old. I don't know. I'm not gonna say anything about JJ. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna say anything about this specific person right now. Yeah, maybe being the coward that most people are. Question is, do they roll? If they're teaching kids and they're not rolling, they might be diddling kids. The cowards. <laughs> no. That gets me off the hook because I had just did rounds of Saul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do you think the government or like the county should vet them somehow? Like all kids, like all people coaching kids should pass a background check. Ah, <sighs> dude, I, I don't, I don't. See, then now we're getting into this territory where how are you going to do something about it? We see it as a problem. We recognize it as a problem. Now we need to be proactive and do something about it. You know, well, I was proactive, but like, you know, it's the same way they talk about like the school shootings and like, and like bringing a bunch of guards with like gun licenses. Though mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't trust an adult with a license any more than I trust a teenager with no license or adult with no license. Like human beings will always find ways to slip through the cracks. To me, like the problem starts way before then. It's it's more about preventive measures. Same way, like am I gonna escape a rear naked choke? What's the preventative measure? I'm not going to escape a rear naked choke when it's fully locked in. Like, we need to go way back and, like, figure out where these problems start and, like... But wouldn't a pre- preventative measure be doing background checks and making sure they haven't had any other issues from getting <clears throat> kicked out of other places? I'm actually... I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not for, I'm not against, like... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm all for background checks. I mean, if you're going to employ somebody, you should have a background check on them and see what their background is, especially if it's martial arts, especially if it's something like jiu-jitsu. We should see what their lineage is and stuff like that. But, I mean, then you run into the whole thing. Kids. Now it's going to be a government regulated issue. They were talking about doing that actually in New York State, and that's why I was wanting to talk about it. But can you imagine what it's going to cost the gym owners or background checks? Oh yeah, and all these people. Well, that, that's my issue, and that's who's going to be covered. This is one burden. of these issues. Like when I start turning into like a libertarian, like who are you to charge us? Like what what the fuck do you know about this industry? Right. Exactly. Like we know why you're doing this. Like because you want money, you want tax revenue. I think uh, one fees. thing you should do when you check out a school is you should see the vibe of the school. You should see the instructor. You see, maybe you you got to look into the instructors oh, yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I would definitely, if I put my kid in anything. Like when he was there with JJ, I kind of watched the class, to be honest with you. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to step in is like I really want to have the kids to have a good example of what a person should be. Yeah. You know, like I would trust Matt Flores with my kid anywhere. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of like how I judge someone. Would I trust my kid with them? You know? Yeah. But I'm not sure I leave that, my kid with a, you to be honest with you. <laughs> but that's a problem. How about me, kid? I mean, that, you, that's yeah, that's the fine. difference between like you know. And you usually hear about these kind of things happening in these gyms in the middle of nowhere. Usually, like in some roller spot. Like I remember this happened. Like I forget exactly where. Uh, I want to say it was like south of Rochester, some place where like 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 a fake black belt was called out. I'm actually friends with uh, the guy that trained underneath him on Facebook with really? one of that guy. Yeah. I know, uh, I forgot what the guy's name was, but they went in and they dojo stormed him eventually. Yeah. So, like, I feel like, you know, yeah, as someone like us who's been in the game for a long time, we, we know enough. We can, we can smell bullshit from a mile away when it comes to an instructor, especially, like, a jiu-jitsu instructor, because jiu-jitsu, you can smell the bullshit a mile away. You know, coming in with a fake black belt. Like, you know, like, that's not a jiu-jitsu black belt. Like, <laughs> it doesn't have the red stripe. <laughs> he got a karate. <laughs> yeah, exa- exactly, man. And you'll see, th- you'll see that shit. Like, people think they get away with that shit. You know, someone that, like, you know, is just bringing their kid on the first, like, kids class, you know, they don't know anything about jiu-jitsu. They don't know anything. They're just like, you know, I just want to get my kid into a sport or, or self-defense or something. So they don't know. So I don't, you know, you don't see that ha- happen to us to, like, a re- recognizable school where there's, like, a lineage and there's something, there's, like, a background to it to defend against, like, the oncoming onslaught of creeps trying to take advantage of a situation. But if it's just, like, that one lone wolf in the middle of nowhere or that one lone wolf that just kind of, like, pops up and maybe marks himself as a grappling class and not a Brazilian jiu-jitsu class, well, that's something else. That's something you got, like, kind of got him was always good at got him was always good at the uh jujitsu police kind of stuff yeah i we almost need someone like in the area like him he used to like have the whole who's got what rank under who i love that he used to do that yeah yeah and you just know like guys that go through 
I mean, guys that go through the whole thing can still be messed up. But by the time they get the purple brown belt, pretty much everyone in the area knows who you are. And they know if you're fucked up or not. And they know whether you should be around kids. I'll to be quite honest with yeah. you, you know? I don't think, I don't think we've, we haven't had this. We never had this problem in the area with jiu-jitsu. No. It's growing, man. Apparently it could Taekwondo, be a problem. Taekwondo, they're fucking... Yeah. <laughs> could be anything. It's Goddamn, hide your kids, hide your wife in Taekwondo, I guess. Horses. But... <laughs> Coach JJ was actually a black belt in Taekwondo and a white belt in Jiu-Jitsu, so just saying. Oh, that makes sense. So I... just Jiu-Jitsu. Don't trust any other sport. Yeah. <laughs> At least uh, when you see guys in Jiu-Jitsu, if they got a brown or black belt on, you know that they've been through the wars. If, yeah. if it's for real. If it's yeah, a real absolutely, belt. Absolutely, man. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. Like, and that's why, no, like, pro side of the IBGF. Minimum time at each belt. You should be, in my opinion, it does take about eight years to get a black belt if you're training a lot. It should take at least eight years. It takes a long time to understand a lot of these concepts. Like, I don't like seeing people get promoted early. People got promoted early, like BG Penn, Damian Maya, Ronda, or um, like people like Hillary Williams. Phenomenal people. And they end up the, like in the right place at the right time. They got the best instructors. And, yeah, they're winning tournaments. But when you hear about somebody get promoted to black belt like five years, it's like, yeah, who are you? You better win worlds if you got black yeah. belt in five years. I'm Exa- serious. Like, exactly. All the exactly. way up. You know? If you win at brown belt, maybe. Yeah. Maybe you don't need to win at black Something belt. Something like Cobrini but, or yeah, something. Yeah. Like, you know? You just don't get to get a black belt. Like, and every now you just like, on Facebook, like, oh, yeah. Fucking, this guy gave himself a red and white belt at, like, 35. <laughs> I saw that, the Corral belt. Yeah. Like, you know, like, what the fuck? Like, who do you think you are, dude? So what do you think about the um the Gracie online school? Oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. It's only the blue belt, though. I don't care. <laughs> you should get more than maybe one stripe. I like this. It's just like, again, that's not jujitsu. You know, I, I as it being like a guitarist, like I can I can go online and I can like study like every scale and like every chord and like you know theory and all that but until i go to a live practice and i jam with musicians and i play shows that's the ultimate catalyst being a good musician is playing live and playing with other musicians that's the dance like i play i I play by myself all the time like uh, and just like practice skills over backing tracks and stuff it makes you good it's not music you know it's just you're just jamming by yourself same way in jujitsu like I can study every MG in action video, every Mendes Brothers video, and it, you know it's good. It gives you something, but like again, it's not it's not harmony. It's it's not bringing it all together. Do you think YouTube helps or hurts uh, beginning people? Not uh, like at our level. I mean, you, now we know how techniques should feel by the time you're purple, brown, black. Well, this, know, this is the time where I think it helps. What do you think about white and blue on YouTube? You, you need to know where to look. Um, and I think that's where having teammates that can kind of guide you. And sometimes I do this, like I see somebody like playing like a uh, style and be like, oh, you know, I like what you're doing there. Why don't you check out this video? But when I first started like, um, I watched a lot of YouTube when I started and I actually credit it to a lot. It brought, it brought me to a lot of new people. So, you know, I watch matches, you know, study their game, you f- but you got to find the right people. Again, it can't be that guy from fucking, fucking bumville wherever who's teaching you some ridiculous omoplata setup that's never going to work he's just doing it because it looks fancy especially when you first start man like so much of your stuff should be fundamental fundamental fundamentals are your i guess foundation wow that's really deep i know it's fucking deep man it's yeah but dude it's it's everything i'm not editing that out it's everything And, like, when I teach class, like, I got a rotating curriculum. I teach the same stuff over and over and over and over. Like, I'll, every few months, I just go back to the same stuff. Like, some of my passing, some of my guard work. So I just, like, people need to know it. Don't let the guy grab your, guard, grab your head in half guard. Don't let, you know, like, you got to get your angle properly in closed guard, like, without creating too much space. Like, just, like, little stuff like that. And in YouTube, like, there's just... There's, it's so oversaturated with like stuff that if you don't know where to look, you can find yourself like down a rabbit hood, rabbit hole that's gonna you know it could set you back a few months, you know it could set back a year, it could set back two years. So if you're gonna go on YouTube, I really suggest you ask somebody that's 
at your gym and be like, well, what do you think my style is? Who do you think I should look at? Who do you think I should study? And I, this is the thing where I think it's the ultimate catalyst to your game. You got to find somebody that you can emulate. So for me, that was always Marcel Garcia. And later became guys like Rafael Haf, Mendez, the Mendez brothers, and uh, um, even guys like, you know, like the Ribeiro brothers, guys in uh, Fernando today, like guys I really respected, guys that were tested and proven. And they had great technique and they had great attitudes. So like if I can study their games and break it down and they got videos to teach me, well, that's worth learning from. But when it gets down to like some purple belt you never heard of teaching you some stuff, like then you got to be careful, man, because that, that can set you back trying to learn some fancy stuff that, you know, it's just it's not going to work against anybody good. That purple belt could be Matt Flores or it could be me, and you definitely want to take Matt Flores' <laughs> shit, not mine. Hey, I do some half <laughs> I love some half girl from Flores. I love Me too. Her. I love one Flores, man. Flores. Me too. He's Flores crazy good. Great half girl. Good, and he's very inspirational. Yeah. Anytime you do a move against somebody, it's like beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. He's like, I can't choke you, K man. I'm like, nope. That's how I think jujitsu, though. I know. It's it's, it's unbelievable. It's just like you, you feel like so good, but you can't feel like sad. It's like, it's like uh, sorry, man. I hope I inspired you. I don't know. I think that's how jujitsu is different than most sports, though, right? That you don't have an ego and you get excited when somebody beats you. Not necessarily get excited about being beaten, but you get inspired to try and do harder. I get pissed off to try and do better. <laughs> yeah, if, I don't it's a, like if it's a higher belt rank, I feel like inspired, like yeah. rolling like Cyborg or Marcelo or like. You know, Sometimes it's embarrassing I, rolling with Flores. Like, it's definitely embarrassing rolling with you, <laughs> to be honest. Sometimes it's embarrassing to me because I know I have to put my ego in check and try and roll with you, and I can't keep up. And that's 100% honest. Yeah. That means I need to get better. One well, of the first things I told her was just like... <laughs> I was in a bad mood. I came... Karis just whispered I was in a bad mood. I came home after <laughs> Dusty smoked me like two weeks before my final. I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> you know, I just tried to match you technique for technique, and I couldn't. And now I need to... Work on transitions more. It's just what it is. I'm usually on top. I don't play on bottom. So when I'm on bottom, I need to work on it a lot. Stupid Dusty. <laughs> I don't know. It's Brandon. I would blame him. Yeah. I mean, the first thing he taught me is that he taught me good techniques that worked for my body, which is, I think, really defining. Because obviously a lot of moves that like Dove shows or that Godin showed, like some of them I wasn't going to be able to do. And even Doves would see it. And he'd be like, you have really small arms. That's never going to work. You're never going to do that joke. But Brandon would be like, this is, you're never going to be bigger than them, but this is what's going to work for your body. Brandon is the man. He is. He is private. It's $269 an hour. <laughs> Check him out. $11,000. <laughs> yeah. Pretty soon you're not going to have to work at all, Brandon. Oh, One no. private a month exactly. and you're good. I mean, it's worth it. BrandonMuckerJujitsu.com. We got the online built training center. <laughs> but Brandon's also the best to roll with, I would say. Because Three easy payments of five hundred dollars, <laughs> one difficult payment of twenty thousand. <laughs> Get your black belt in two years. But I know for me, rolling with Brandon, you and take I think payment plan. <laughs> five hundred dollars a week. It's pain. It's pain. <laughs> I think a lot of people feel that rolling with Brandon's good because he's smaller, but he's also very technical. But the thing is, Brandon knows how to rep or like rub it up on you. Like I know that I get confident in my skills sometimes and I was like, oh, I'm doing this technique really good. And then I'll start to shit talk a little bit and then he'll tap me out like three times and it'll get my ego in check like right there. Okay, man, you know how happy I was. When you train with him? Yeah. I know. You talk about every podcast. I took a private with Brandon once and I was good. And then I stopped training and I suck. Um, train more with Brandon. Private, $600 an hour. You got it. No problem. Oh, it's going up, man. Jeez. <laughs> He's getting better every second. <laughs> now he's a black belt. He was a brown belt last time. Pretty yeah. soon he's going to have a stripe in a few years. And then it just keeps going up and up and up. It's, every day he's better. He's thinking about jujitsu right now. He's just got yeah. a little bit incrementally better. One last thing before we got here, because yeah. I know this is really dragging on. And you're looking uncomfortable over there. <laughs> Can you talk <laughs> about... You guys got like a porta potty here? Yeah. Well, you just <laughs> go in your pants, man. You got nowhere. You need to go? I'll pause it. Cape okay, man. <laughs> company dappers yeah <laughs> male adult dappers <laughs> so training through, training through injuries this is the last thing i want to touch on i've seen you come off the mat you walk like an old man you yeah. barely move um that happens a lot and jujitsu is a really tough sport on your body what would you say to someone that's trying to deal with injuries and trying to train through them like you have <sighs> well if you got the same mindset as me you're not going to train through a lot of 
a lot of shit. So um, my right hip has been very on and off since I was a purple belt. So like, if I train too much, it'll start locking up. So if I sit down on the couch or if I get up out of bed, like it'll lock up. And every now and then, like you just sit down for maybe like a minute. And sometimes you sit down for a while and it doesn't bother you all, but you stand up and it locks up. I really don't have the problem with my hip while rolling a lot, but every now and then it will like pop. So I had that, then I had a shoulder thing, then I have a knee thing. But I would say for a lot of injuries, drink a lot of water. <laughs> drink a lot of water. Water's really good. Don't get too wasted because alcohol dehydrates you. Alcohol dehydrates you. But if you if you're like me and you like you know, you're really German Irish and you just like <laughs> it's just in you and you like a good beer. Well, try to drink a beer try to drink a water in between every two beers. You got sixteen ounce water. However, <laughs> if you like to roll drunk, like I don't <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know where I'm going with that. For injuries like you know, if you're a competitor, you know if 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 you want to make it a living and you want to do something about like you want to go fire in a major tournament, then you gotta roll through injuries. Um, like you you don't want to obviously roll through something that's torn or broken, obviously. But like, <laughs> but we're going to. But if you got a sprain, so yeah, sometimes you gotta wrap that shit up and ice it and come back, like, cause your opponent somewhere in the favela of Curitiba, Brazil, is probably going to be training through that stuff. So if you want to match his level, his toughness, then you got to be equally tough. you got to be more tough. And you got to be gritty. And you got to be a savage. And us first world folk need to understand that if you want to be a world champion. I, I Like, you know, the Americans are starting to make progress in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but most of the people are still... From Brazil, and I, I feel like that kind of like being away from the American environment and growing up in a situation where you're not afforded the same luxuries. No and, Paul's Donuts in Brazil. <laughs> you know, I've been to Brazil. They got a lot of good sweets. <laughs> they got a lot of great sweets. I spent a little bit of time in Brazil. And it's, it's a little more simpler, you know. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful It's a beautiful place. But, like, you know, us as humans always trying to progress and trying to rise above, and I think when you get to a certain level in anything, be music, jujitsu, whatever your occupation may be, you get content with it, and you don't have to work as hard, because why do you? Especially when you, you know, you get settled into your dwelling, and you get your family, or your partner, or whatever, and you, you know, you get comfortable, you don't need to work as hard. But for that kid that's growing up, you know, in a favela, training three times a day worrying for his life worrying how he's ever gonna get out of this hellhole well if you're gonna if you're an american going through that kind of stuff like you need to match that level you need to match the intensity you gotta really 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 want it and i'm not talking about three times a week four times a week. i'm talking about if you want to be a world champion you need to be training at least 12 times a week at least there's no joke about it like you need to quit your job your full-time job, that is. You need to figure out what kind of side income you can do. You need to ask your professor if you can sleep on the mats or wash the mats for tuition. Like, you need to go down that route. There's no other way around it, man. The one thing America does have is wrestling. So a lot of the best fighters come from a wrestling background in America. Which is just like you're describing three times a day. Of it's gritty. Just beating the shit out of yeah. each other. No job, no time for anything, yeah. no food. Same thing with American wrestlers. A lot of the, a lot of the great wrestlers come from like kind of like, you know, rural areas. They come from like Oklahoma or they come from like Iowa, Pennsylvania. Know, Pennsylvania. Yeah. yeah. So they come a lot of farm boys. Farm boys work on the farm like strong bastards. Yeah. Farm boys Fucking tough. Farm. And yeah, sometimes you get like some suburban like a lot of Long Island like people are really good wrestlers. Even section 6 brings a lot of good wrestlers. But you got to find that grittiness within you. You got to match that level because you know that somewhere out there, somebody is training harder than you, man. They always are. And they possibly training longer than you. They've been training since they've been able to walk because their dad was a wrestler or something. And they recognize the potential in it. So, Ray, get your kids in my kids' class soon. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying. They want to take privates from me. It's only $32,000. Wow. This price. 
That's for a half hour. That's for a half hour. Damn, I got to stop pushing in kilos. You get, oh you get discount for a full hour. I know, now I don't 64 for an hour. Yeah. Special. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming in, Brandon. I appreciate it. We're over the two-hour mark, so I'm going to let you out of here before you pee in your pants. My <laughs> pleasure, Caveman. I, uh, I appreciate you coming in. Got anything? Any final words? Oh. oh what was I going to say? I think you've said it all. I think you're going to propose. I'm pretty sure we need a proposal on this show. <laughs> I love you, Guinness. Yeah. Oh, oh, damn. <laughs> Sorry, baby. No love, proposal from Brandon. Love you. Love you. Sorry to throw under the bus, but that's what we do here on Caveman's Corner. <laughs> Ready to get out of here, Ray? Hell yeah. All right, let's, let's, uh, let's do the Mexican music. <laughs> Mexican music, all right. For our Mexican. Coming from the caveman house and North Buffalo, we are out of here. <sighs> About time. This was a mess. <laughs> yeah. oh, you had that was the best. Ray knows I'm still recording. That's the best part. <laughs> Mickey still poops his pants. <laughs> Not one Mickey poops the pants, so I gotta get this in the Easter egg too. See a Mickey, you pants pooper. And caveman still cries when he rolls with curls. I do. <laughs> Only the ones that beat me. <laughs> Is there a bathroom? Yeah, right next.